sacred space and the understanding of the role of sacred space and human experience. And uh, I want to begin by just just uh, saying a word about who I am and why I'm interested in this, why I'm teaching it. And uh, uh, if any of you would like to share what your interest in a particular topic is for a moment, we can certainly do that. I'm Robert Moore. I'm professor of psychology and religion at Chicago Theological Seminary. Uh, I do a lot of work in the in uh, the psychology of religion, the relationship between uh, uh, phenomenology of religion and uh, and psychology. And uh, I have a private analytical practice in Hyde Park and Evanston, so I keep busy. Uh, I've done a good bit of research on uh, a field research on minority religions to get at some of these things. Uh, book you may be interested in that I co-authored with Gordon Melton is a book called The Cult Experience, uh, Responding to the New Religious Pluralism. One of the things that you learn when you study contemporary minority religious groups is that they have a real sensitivity, a lot of them, to these dynamics that, uh, that we'll be talking about um, that are not shared by, by establishment of religious groups. Uh, so anyway, I do a lot of work in this field, and I have been uh, spending a lot of time uh, working on uh, a contemporary understanding of ritual. I, uh, you may want to look uh, at the uh, uh, September 1983 issue of Zygon, the Journal of Religion and Science, <clears throat> which I co-edited uh, uh, around a... a um, Symposium on Ritual and Human Adaptation uh, for the Institute for Religion and Age of Science, uh, which, the, which was built around the work of Victor Turner, one of the persons we'll be looking at in this course. Um, and um, I, if I can find a copy of that journal, I will bring um, I will bring it next week. And if any of you want copies of Victor Turner's article in which he relates the brain body, uh, which is certainly related to this topic talks about Jung in relationship to his work, the theory of archetypes in relationship to recent work in brain and phys neurophysiology. I hope you'd be welcome to have, have copies made uh, for you. Uh, uh, but anyway, so I, I've been working on that for some time. I spent my sabbatical year last year working on uh, implications of particularly Turner's work for uh, work in the field of psychology and religion. I've uh, been doing a lot of work on this uh, understanding of uh, sacred space in psychology and religion, and uh, I'm currently co-editing a book uh, entitled Anthropology and the Study of Religion, in which some of the work uh, that you'll be, we'll be discussing together will be uh, published as one of the chapters in that, in that book, in the section on Turner. Today we're going to uh, get a general orientation and um, and really spend some time on Eliade. And uh, next week we will look at Victor Turner. Uh, they have the ritual process book for you, uh, which I hope you can read uh, uh, for next week. Uh, the third session, as I say, we're going to be talking about our own experience of the quest for some form, some sort of regenerative space, and uh, where we have personally experienced that sort of uh, space. And after we get through next week, you will realize that uh, that uh, extraordinary, extraordinary regenerative space <clears throat> comes in two different forms. Uh, what Victor Turner calls liminal and liminoid, and we'll be talking next week about the difference between those two, and it will give you a wide enough, uh, we'll, we'll get enough of a sense about the difference between the two and how, and how they function, that you'll be able, that all of you have had experiences of, uh, of uh, extraordinary space. Uh, some of you have more uh, 
intensive ones than others, mm -hmm. obviously. Uh, <clears throat> but, uh, but I want you to be thinking from now about that and uh, reflecting about your experiences of space. Uh, and of course, with that time, we call this, of course, on sacred time, uh, because one doesn't come without the other. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, you're only in that third round that and, uh, and learning from each other. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to be doing a lot of work on this in the future, and uh, you can help me by, by sharing your experiences uh, of this sort of thing with me and with the group. The last week we will talk about psychotherapy and the particular kind of uh, uh, space which is constituted in a great many forms of therapy. Uh, and uh, and uh, then we will focus in on uh, depth psychology, uh, psychoanalysis, uh, Freudian and Jungian uh, uh, recent understandings and Freudian and Jungian thought uh, about uh, this topic. Uh, there is at this time a a uh, real revolution occurring in an understanding of this uh, uh, material. Uh, and it's funny because, you see, Carl Jung, long ago, uh, talked about uh, analysis uh, in relationship to alchemy and uh, saw the analytical relationship as a parallel to the to the uh, sealed vessel, uh, the, uh, the alchemical vessel, the alchemical container uh, in which transformation occurs. And for many years, uh, people would read his writings on the transference, uh, uh, which is something else if you're into reading. Uh, it would be good for you to read before that last session, in addition to what I've assigned, uh, his uh, writings on the psychology of the transference. Uh, uh, but uh, but now, I mean, they thought it was mystical and, and uh, uh, obscure and totally useless. Uh, and uh, now they're beginning to realize, even the Freudians are beginning to realize that uh, that transference, and we'll get into this deeply that last session, the transference is not merely a repeat of an old, quote, object relationship, unquote, in the present. That is, it's not merely a repetition of a parental relationship in the present acted out with the analyst. But there's something far more significant about the analytic relationship and the transference than that, and it is, uh, uh, according to people like Robert Lang, uh, the key to transformation, sine qua non, of transformation. And so we will be getting into that uh, in depth uh, that last week. Uh, now, uh, I don't argue that analysis, psychotherapy, and analysis is the only place that sacred space exists in contemporary culture, in contemporary American culture, for example. I would certainly get in one place where uh, this type of uh, experience exists, and there are many others. We can, we'll, be, we'll be talking about those things uh, as, as we go, especially in the third and fourth sections. Now, are there any questions before we go on? No? Okay, now what I want to begin with is to look at this together. And uh, this handout on the structure of initiation. Uh, uh, the, the chart on the back uh, developmental periods and uh, major transitions from seasons of a man's life. Uh, I include it for you because when we're talking about uh, your experiences, the third session, uh, I think when you look at your experiences, you will find that your, your largest quest for regenerative space occurs during transition space of some kind on some major either life cycle transition or some tr some transition elicited by a trauma of some form uh, has kicked you into a transition state. Uh, uh, that is as old as the human race. Uh, when you need a regenerative place, whether it's because you became a, you came to puberty or 
whether it's because you had a death uh, in your relationships of some sort, uh, there's always that return to uh, the quest or some kind of place in which you can deal with that. And so I just share this as one model that's going around today about thinking about that. So I want, to, I want you to be thinking about kind of the relationship in your lives, and appreciate you raising this uh, earlier, between uh, the quest for regenerative space and transition in your life, because you look to find that uh, there is a very close relationship. And if you get this really clear in your mind, then it will help you to understand a lot of people around you. Uh, because not only will you observe people who are acting funny, uh, with which they're really looking for some sort of extraordinary space and time, uh, and maybe searching for it in funny ways, odd ways, crazy ways. Uh, but it will make sense to you out of their behavior. And uh, a lot of people's behavior will begin to make, besides your own, will begin to make sense to you if you start thinking this way. What I want to do now is go back to the front and run through this, because this is a uh, map of a number of theories, uh, some of which we'll be looking at in here, and all of which we are free to discuss. Uh, uh, but uh, but it gives you a little sense about um, some of the geography that we want to traverse. Uh, the uh, movement here is from left to right. Uh, and the sacred space uh, is the center uh, column. Occurrences in the center. A profane space would be phase one and phase three. And that is um, uh, ordinary, ordinary time precedes and, uh, uh, and follows after uh, experiences of sacred space and time. Uh, if you can get out of the sacred space. Now, there are people that enter it and can't get out. I call that uh, chronic liminality, and I discuss that uh, in this uh, book, Cult Experience. Uh, uh, but there are many other ways to get into sacred space and not to be able to find your way out. That's what myths talk about all the time. That's what the discussion of Ariadne's thread is about. Uh, you, uh, you have, if you're going to get into sacred space and time, you better know something about it or you better have a knowledgeable guide, because if you don't, uh, you may not find your way back out of the labyrinth. And, uh, and uh, we will be, we can talk more about that tonight. But anyway, so phase one is the, the, uh, the state of ordinary space and time, which we'll be talking about in the audience view of this uh, tonight. Uh, uh, Phase two is uh, is this uh, regenerative space, which uh, which uh, occurs. Uh, it, it sacred doesn't mean good. I want you to be clear about that. Uh, an experience of sacred space and time is often a horrible experience. Horrible, and uh, it's only nice, sweet, liberal. Christians who have managed to so sacralize the experience of the sacred as to confuse people about this, because the experience of the sacred is vastly more of the time not a pleasant experience. And if you study the history of religions throughout the human race, there is, of course, a great sweet nectar in the experience of the presence of Krishna. There's also Kali who comes in sacred space and time. And, uh, and so we'll be talking about that uh, going on. Now, uh, so, so then if you have the thread or a ritual elder that's knowledgeable, you can get out of this when you're appropriately cooked. This is the tomb of the womb and the womb of the tomb in the middle. And it is the alchemical vessel. It is where you are cooked when you need to be cooked. And hopefully when you're done, you will be removed rather than overcooked or undercooked. 
you leave before your coat, it's an abortion. And there are many, many people, as we will talk about, who are stillborn from Savior's grace, or who are uh, like uh, uh, premature babies who simply cannot make it once they leave the world. They simply have not stayed in the world long enough. And this is a parallel in terms of psychic rebirth as well as birth. Uh, now, the great masters who talked about this, of course, are, uh, are uh, Van Gennep, Arnold uh, Van Gennep, whose book, The Rites of Passage, is one you should read if you haven't read it. There's a good University of Chicago Press paperback version of that. Uh, he is the person who really did the pioneering work in understanding these phases in, in ritual passage. Victor Turner, the, the great anthropologist who was tragic uh, early death uh, in December, uh, just wiped a lot of us out, is the person that carried this forward and made it possible for us to use these materials in relationship to modern contemporary culture. Uh, of course, most of you are familiar with Joseph Campbell's work on mythology, and particularly his book, uh, Hero with a Thousand Faces, which if you hadn't read, I hope you will read before you get through with this class. Um, and of course, the great master of history and phenomenology of religion, Merchant Eliade, uh, who is uh, one of the most under-appreciated uh, uh, scholars, uh, even though he is a distinguished uh, professor at the University of Chicago. The importance of his work uh, still has not been realized widely uh, because they still think of him as an antiquarian of religion, somebody who collects interesting facts, publishes all these books. And they don't realize that in his work is contained so much material for the renewal of culture and for the capacity of human beings to, to, to cherish and uh, value each other's conditions with what Bernard Malin called an appreciative consciousness. Uh, in Eliade's work is so much rich resources for us to come and be able to appreciate a tradition other than our own. And uh, so I'm happy that we're having some time to deal with him. Uh, Freud, I, I could list a number of other uh, psychoanalytic theorists, but, uh, but uh, uh, there are many, many uh, there have been many understandings uh, by different analysts and psychotherapists of the specialness of space and psychotherapy. I put in contemporary occultists because I do a lot of research on the occult and the magical practices, and uh, uh, you get the same thing there. Uh, the, uh, the, I put in the uh, crisis and grief process and reintegration because this is something that's often not thought of in these terms. But it's quite clear that when someone has had a, a, a significant loss, their geography changes, radically changes, and they do not in the same, and do not experience in a similar way after the grief is over. And some people again never finish their grief, and the world never congeals again. And we might say they are in chronic liminality that they can't get back to. Profane space. You see, profane space is not bad. It doesn't have the, the meaning that uh, we we attach that word. It, 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 it is where you have to live. It's it's life out of Eden. Uh, so it's not good to stay in sacred space and time more than you need to. But anyway, so the grief process is something we know much about, but very few people have ever thought about it in this context. <laughs> And of course, I've already mentioned therapy and uh, what worship experiences in the church ought to be. But so few clergy understand anything about this that um, their attempts to have communitas come off as high y'all uh, and, uh, and their attempts to, uh, to use liturgy, liturgy effectively so often come off as what Victor Turner talks about as ceremonial as opposed to ritual, which means to say uh, the distinction he makes between ceremonial and ritual is <clears> that ceremonial upholds the status quo. In Yogi, in terms, we would say it does not allow the shadow to appear. 
uh, it represses the shadow. This is why so many churches are persona dominated. Uh, and there's no place for the shadow to appear. You've done away with the true confessional, what was the real confessional, where the shadow really appeared. And we've replaced it with uh, rote confessions where the shadow never appears. And so uh, uh, my sense is, is that churches do, and I think it may very well happen because of some of these materials being rediscovered. But the churches do, for a revolution, a, a revolutionary uh, reappropriation of pre-Reformation Christianity uh, based on a deeper understanding of ritual process and these materials, which are now made possible through resources that never existed before. Uh, yes? Is this a different place for that kind of religion is actually being threatened? Outside of the cult, uh, I have a negative impression of the cult. I'm sure you would argue some of that. Uh, well, it's very interesting. Some of the best work that's being done in this area, uh, uh, most of it is being done on the margins. And of course, I put minority religions on the margin. I also put a lot of the humanistic psychology people on the margins. But the interesting thing is that a lot of people, uh, and what we know euphemistically is humanistic psychology, there are many creative people doing experimentation with ritual. And, uh, 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 ritual processes and, and uh, spirituality uh, in that movement, uh, sort of the New Age people. They're doing, they're doing a lot of things. Now, they, they don't know this material well enough to be able to do it carefully, and, uh, and so there are a lot of casualties. It's like the Sorcerer's Apprentice. Uh, you get people who understand the power of ritual process, but don't know what rigor it takes to become a ritual elder. And so uh, you have a lot of casualties out of this. But they're the ones who are doing the most. It's embarrassing to me uh, as a uh, theologian of the things and a uh, uh, religious leader and spiritual director of sorts. Uh, it's embarrassing to me how Neanderthal, the church, is on this topic. And, uh, and I do what I can to confront this uh, lack of appreciation for the heterogeneity of space in the contemporary church. Uh, now, we'll be able to talk about that more later. I'm not recommending a return to pre-modern views of this. Pre-modern views of this are very dangerous. And uh, the ones that exist around a lot of the places, for example, uh, in a number of churches throughout the world, not in the United States, but throughout the world, there still is a deep understanding of sacred space in the Orthodox Church, particularly, and uh, uh, a number of others. But, they, but that's combined with a, with a pre-modern worldview, which makes it uh, uh, authoritarian. And, uh, well, we'll talk about that one night. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> If you look at this in terms of moving this way, then getting into uh, getting into sacred space is a trial, either voluntary or involuntary. Uh, there are rituals of degradation that always occur. Like you saw the sound door, sacred space. I, I laughed when I saw that because I thought, well, we should have something on there about what rituals of humiliation we're going to have to have before you can cross the threshold, see? <laughs> But, but in order to get into sacred space, there always must be submission. And uh, to symbolize that submission, uh, cultures have done all sorts of things, uh, uh, which include uh, all sorts of rituals of humiliation. Hazing. We, we speak of hazing, fraternity hazing. That is a ritual. The insight that if you're going to get into sacred space, you must be humbled. You cannot, uh, the Hindus have, have, a, have a sort of saying about temples that you cannot profane a temple. Because if you enter the temple uh, uh, in an arrogant way, you never found it. You cannot find the temple uh, with an unbent head or an unbowed knee, we might say. You cannot find it. 
And so these rituals of degradation, which we can talk about a resignation, surrendering autonomy, denial of agency, various degradation mechanisms that are used in, in primitive cultures, they're symbolic of the spirit with which one must enter these, enter this space. The sine qua non, you can't get in it without it. Now the interesting thing is some people are forced into it by tragedy in their lives. They're forced into it by suffering that is inflicted upon them by events in their lives. So life does not say, would you like to interstate this place? It slaps you up beside the head with an experience that is so traumatic for you that you are indeed humbled. I mean, all of your narcissism that you that you had been prizing so well had just been collapsed by some ill you the knees um, entirely, great deal. And you will find, and we'll talk about this later, you will find that people uh, get destabilized into the quest for sacred space. We, we say, in fact, that's kind of maybe compensated for this. Or you might think about it, they, they get something happens to them and they go into a spin. Uh, well, uh, it can happen that way, or it can happen uh, by a person realizing that they need regeneration. It's not a panic, it's not a acute thing, it's a still small voice which they listen to. And then they can down the go what we would call a controlled regression, a regression in service of the ego. Uh, they can decide to enter analysis, or they can decide to go in a spiritual direction. And they, they don't, they, they, at this point, they don't have to do it. So there's a, there's a difference. But you will notice the common thing is that, they, that there is a spirit of submission, whether it is a spirit which is brought about by uh, events or, or a, a act of will. Any questions about that before I go on? Okay. Okay. Now, if you notice, uh, getting out but is, uh, is a reverse process. And uh, a lot of the time, it's extremely difficult to get out. Uh, that's why there's so much human wreckage around from this stuff. There often has to be a hand, either a foot that kicks the person out from inside, uh, they get booted out when it's time for them to go, or someone from the outside reaches in and, and helps them out. A sort of corsets delivery uh, out of sacred uh, time. Uh, yeah. Well, see, it's very easy because when you're in this middle phase here, your ego is not functioning well. The reality testing is not functioning well. That is, in terms of Freud's secondary principle. Or, or reality principle. Uh, your deeper reality, your, it, it's suspended uh, for good reason, but that is to say it's very, you're disoriented because you're not oriented in linear time anymore. Time, for example, if you have something that you're really grieving about, uh, many of you may have, I mean, I have, uh, it's amazing what it does to your perception of time, because your previous perceptions of, of the meaningfulness of linear time are shot, and linear time becomes not very meaningful at all. It's just amazing it just goes dead, and uh, and so uh, this this uh, middle phase is uh, very disorient disorient. As I say, it can be a sweet time, but it's often a horrible time. I see that. And uh, uh, we will get, yeah.
I don't think that it has both. Um, you feel it's terrible sometimes, you feel it. One is I consider it self, so not. And other times, you know, now the drink. Mm-hmm. It's not like one or the other. Yeah, I think for some people it is, but I do know people for whom it's never uh, manic There's never a manic pole to it. So you get people, you get people who uh, are on a manic pole during this. You know, manic depressive illness quite on here. Uh, uh, or you get people on a depressive pole, or you get people who have a bipolar, psychothymic. The action would be what you're describing, back and forth. But um, uh, so at any rate, uh, uh, we will be putting a lot of flesh on, on what the experience is like in the space and time um, as we go. Now, I would like to spend a little time. How long do we have? We have nine o'clock. I would like to spend a little time. Uh, presenting to you on Iliadi on this topic and then leave some, you know, at least 30 minutes for us tonight to discuss Iliadi's concepts here. Uh, and uh, would that be okay with you? Okay. That's what I would, yes. Yeah. Sure. Yes. Yes. Well, that's one way. I'm going to get into that more now. But uh, that is my translation. And, uh, and it, it goes like, it would, be, it would be in some ways better to say ordinary and extraordinary. See? Uh, uh, sacred could be, see, sacred and profane carry so much baggage with people that they often, that they often don't understand what it meant in tribal culture. Uh, they assume that it meant that tribal people, that they, a lot of people assume Eliade thinks that tribal people didn't think that all time was religiously significant. In fact, I was at a meeting recently in which I was presenting some of these things and I had a, a Protestant uh, person uh, really raking me over the coals because I, he thought, I, by using these terms, he thought I was suggesting, and he thinks Iliadi is suggesting, that that for homo religiosus or religious human beings, uh, that profane time is not religiously significant, which is clearly thinking the truth. That's not what Iliadi means at all. Profane time is very religiously significant because for the tribal individual, all time and space is religiously significant. Uh, 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 that's not the point. The point is that all time is not regenerative. See? So some there there are certain times which uh, drain you, and there are certain times which renew you. And uh, the uh, this Protestant person, uh, I'm a Protestant, so I mean I get hassled a lot. They think I'm a papist. Uh, uh, he does not want to believe that there is such a thing as a heterogeneity of, of space. And so uh, he bases that on the Christian assumption that all time is significant theologically. And I have tried to tell him that, yes, that's true. All time is theologically significant. But all time is not homogenous. There are times and spaces which are regenerative and times and spaces which are not. And any human being that you talk to for any length of time, if they're honest, will be able to tell you that in their experience, time is not homogeneous that there are times and spaces which are healing and regenerative and times and spaces which are killing and draining and, uh, and uh, et cetera. And there are a lot of little cycles within the larger cycle. Yeah. But anyway, so let me, let me uh, 
proceed here. Uh, I can't emphasize enough, and we just got to get this very clear, the importance of Iliadi's concept of the heterogeneity of space. Now, it's interesting. This concept what is, is probably the most key concept in all of his work. It ties all of his work together. But it's interesting that very few scholars have ever picked up on the importance of this type of the heterogeneity of space. Because for Iliadi, it is the one assumption that underlies everything in his work. If you pull away that concept, everything that he's written falls apart. If time is homogenous, if space and time are homogenous, then, then what he's written about is all right. Now, what this means is that in Iliadi's view, now remember for Iliadi, this is true of archaic human beings. Iliadi does not believe this is true for moderns, for contemporaries. That's why we've got to learn from Iliadi, but get beyond Iliadi. Iliadi believes that for moderns, time is homogenous and space is homogenous. That is simply not true. He's wrong about that. But, uh, and, and, but, and his assertion that that, that is the case for moderns has, is one of the reasons, I think, why his work is not being picked up and used to interpret people's experience today. Or, if, you don't, if you don't have uh, tools for looking, concepts for looking, uh, see, that's what we'll talk about next week when we talk about Turner. Because Turner has given us tools which make it possible for us to look at modern experience and to see that indeed it is not homogenous. That, this, that the experience of space is indeed not homogenous in modernity. So that is the key. Turner is the key bridge between Van Gallup and Eliade on the one hand and our contemporary theorists and so forth on the other. Uh, I mean, I, I extend Turner's work as I will show you as we go. But, uh, but uh, it's, it's important to realize that for Eliade, the only people that could really experience this were people in tribal culture, people in uh, pre-modern culture. And there's, it's, it's quite clear that there were ritual elders around then who knew how to interpret it and teach it and, and had categories for this sort of thing. And it is very difficult for moderns. One of the things that I assume is that your experience has been that it's been hard to find sacred space. Uh, and, and if you've been able to find it, hard to find uh, uh, knowledgeable elders. See? Uh, and, uh, and without many knowledgeable elders around, then other time indeed does look homogenous. Because in primitive culture, without the ritual elders, nobody could have ever found the sacred time and space. In fact, you had to have a diviner, you know, you had to have somebody, a lot of times you'd be out with your herd, you know, and, and uh, with, your, with your people going, and you'd be needing to find a sacred space, and so you wouldn't be able to find it. So you would have somebody who was a diviner located, find a sign as to where it's located. Uh, but anyway, let me go on. Uh, uh, let me just read you a quote from, uh, uh, from this, let's see, let me just summarize. The differences between sacred space and sacred time, I mean, profane time, is this. In profane space and time, there is no fixed point or center from which you can gain orientation. There is no oxus mundi, as he puts it, no, no cosmic uh, tree, no, uh, no pillar that leads to the heavens. There's, there's no column that orients the world, and that's the experience of modernity. And that is an experience of modernity. You know, people would say, where is it, you know? Well, you know, what, what do Jungians talk about when they're talking about the, uh, the uh, fixed point or center from which one gains orientation? But, you know, the self, that's the Jungian concept of the self, uh, with a capital S. Uh, but uh, but with, the, with the archaic, archaic peoples, they, they ritually could establish, could find the center. 
projected, of course, but but out there, Mount Sinai, was the center of the world. Golgotha, for medieval Christians, the center of the cosmos. Uh, timely reverence, say. Uh, okay. In profane time, there is no contact with what is really real. And there's no contact with a power which can renew life and through which regeneration can occur. So if you're in profane time, ordinary time, you can't find the center, you can't find the power that you need, the power which you need for regeneration. You just can't locate it. It's like knowing there's an umbilical cord somewhere that you can't find it. So moderns typically culturally decide there isn't one. Somewhere. Okay, so profane space is a formless expanse. It's homogenous in its fundamental unreality, meaninglessness. It's devoid of creativity. And rather than persons and things being created and renewed in profane space, that is the locus of the deterioration. It's what Eliade calls ordinary temporal duration. That's what profane time is, ordinary temporal duration. That's time as you experience in Sartre's no exit. Now, homo religiosus is different. This is a quote from Eliade. For religious man, excuse him, ladies, Space is not homogenous. He experiences interruptions, breaks in it. Some parts of space are qualitatively different from others. Quote, do not draw nigh hither, says the Lord to Moses. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Exodus 3, 5. Unquote. There is then a sacred space, and hence a strong significant space. There are other spaces that are not sacred and so are without structure. But for religious man, the spatial and the experience of an opposition between space that is sacred, the only real and really existing space, and all other space, the formless expanse surrounding it. Unquote. So it is the possibility for finding a tear in the fabric of ordinary time and space that allows for the world to be regenerated. If you can't find the tear, you can't be regenerated. Now that's true. That was true, it is true, and will always be true for human beings. But we, we have been such exiles from a religious understanding of the human experience that uh, it's been difficult for us to, to see. I think we are biologically wired for this sort of thing. Uh, you read that article by Turner on brain, body, and ritual. And, uh, and you might say that we know, our, our bodies know when we need a regenerative space. Um, but we so often in modern culture can't find some, uh, somebody that knows to dance. So the organism wants to dance, and there's nobody to dance with it. And uh, so hopefully if they find a, a good hairdresser or a good analyst, uh, something good can happen. But uh, a lot of the time people simply don't find it. Any questions before I go on? I got 20 minutes to get all this done. Okay. Now, when you have this break in the fabric, a point of orientation is revealed. This is what Iliadi calls a hierophany. H-I-E-R-O-C-H-A-N-Y, hierophany, manifestation of the sacred. He also uses the word 
Kratopathy, K-R-A-T-O, planet, which means manifestation of power. Uh, they've essentially the same thing. Uh, so this eruption of the sacred has the effect of detaching this territory where this happens from the surrounding territory. This is why you find that temples throughout the world, if you excavate archaeologically on temple spots, you will find that the spot was sacred throughout hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years and through the overlapping of many different cultures because the, the sacrality of the place so affects the cultures around it. It works like a magnet organizing everything around it and so you get it sacred to the Muslims, sacred to the Christians, sacred to the Jews, and underneath that sacred to the primitive peoples that lived there prior to that time. Uh, I once stood uh, in Mississippi uh, on an Indian mound that had uh, uh, become a uh, cemetery for the settlers. It was a back of a very isolated place, and I was amazed that this place had been sacred to Indians, and sacred to slaves, and sacred to slave masters. So all this, all this sacrality of this place on a high spot overlooking the river, it's obviously a ritual center for the Indians. But this Jacob's dream in Bethel, let me, let me give a quote from that. The symbolism implicit in the expression gate of heaven is rich and complex. The theophany, the theophany that occurs in a place consecrates it by the fact that it makes it open above, that is, in communication with heaven. The paradoxical point of passage from one mode of being to another. Often there is no need for a theophany, or a theophany is just a manifestation of God, or a hierophany, properly speaking. A sign can suffice to indicate the sacredness of a place. Some tribes turn loose a goat. Wherever that goat goes, that's the sacred place. And that's where you set up your altar. Often when no sign manifests itself, it is provoked, that is, through some uh, leaders' uh, work. It amounts to evoking sacred forms or figures for establishing an orientation, finding the center. You gotta find the center. Can't find the center. Can't get in touch with regenerative powers. So, uh, you gotta locate it. That's one step. But it's not enough to locate it. Because when you have the formation of a sacred space, you have immediately the formation of the boundary. Those are the boundaries. And if it were drawn right, it would be all the way around it. Because a hierophany creates a boundary, threshold, between sacred in profane space. Now, uh, Iliadi says that uh, that these have been expressed always in enclosures, walls, circles of stones. Think of Stonehenge. Uh, circles of stones were the most ancient sanctuaries. But you always have the enclosure, and the the boundaries of the sacred space always have to be stewarded. There is some concern for the stewarding and maintenance of the boundaries of the sacred space. Now, this is something that, uh, that Iliadi doesn't uh, give a whole lot of attention to in terms of the ritual leadership. It's surprising how little attention he gives to it. Uh, but uh, but, uh, but it is a, uh, an important point. You've got to have proper respect for the boundary between the sacred and the profane space. Otherwise, you're going to get harmed by it rather than helped by it. Now, when we get into talking about analysis and other kinds of experiences of sacred space, 
from your own experience, you will be able to elaborate on that. Because getting in and getting out at the right time is hard. And uh, it, it is a dangerous business at best. Now, in, in the archaic traditions, there's all kinds of rituals surrounding getting in and getting out. All this stuff about take off the shoes from off your feet. Uh, in many traditions, ritual ablutions, washing, very, you know, all sorts of purification rituals that, that you go through to, before you enter. Uh, uh, all sorts of gestures of approach uh, in terms of uh, body postures, gestures with the hands, uh, chanting of various mantras, various forms of uh, uh, mantras. Uh, all kinds of rites and prescriptions, bare feet, etc. Uh, and you can just study throughout the history of phenomenology of religion. All of these things that people do in order to prepare themselves to approach it. Now, uh, that recognition of and respect for the boundary ought to give us a lot of pause. Now, think about this. Because if human beings have been doing this for aeons, they must know something. I mean, why is it that human beings of all the different cultures, I mean, if you look closely, they pay attention to this stuff. You know, I mean, it tends to be ubiquitous in human history. Uh, some sense for, for that care uh, in approaching, entering, and leaving uh, regenerative spaces. There are places you can find which you have anticipations of modernity here and there. But, uh, but for the most part, pre-modern human beings uh, really had a sense for this. Uh, so the most fundamental practical affirmation of the reality of the importance of that heterogeneity of space and the importance of the boundary is the way in which that boundary is, is feared and, and carefully maintained and stewarded by elders of various kinds. Uh, now, we'll be talking about that a lot as we go. Uh, now, uh, you know, for Iliadi, uh, sacred space is when the stories of the ancestors are told. It's where the gods appear. Uh, it is where uh, the uh, things that were done in the beginning can be imitated. The prototypes or unions would say the archetypes are present in that kind of space. Now, as I say, uh, as I've said in my own work, I assume that where you get the sacred and regenerative space, you've had transition. Eliade is not unaware of that. He talks about the importance of initiation in this context. But if you don't understand the importance of this heterogeneity of space business, and and the, and and that is that we're talking about transformative space here, you can miss so much in Iliadi by assuming Iliadi is just interested in cosmogonic myths and things like that. He's not. I mean, he he really understands that 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 what is being talked about in terms of sacred space is regeneration regeneration of the world because primitive peoples assumed they were regenerating the entire world when they were doing this. Uh, the moderns know you are regenerating the entire world because your whole world is shot when you need a regenerative space and uh, everything is, is uh, tainted by the deterioration that occurs in you when you've had a trauma or you've come to transition phase in your life. So uh, there's always, and, and for example, initiation, this regression to the uterus, uh, to the womb, tomb of the womb, the womb of the tomb. 
and uh, and so there is a there is a prototype for sacred space in the body of the mother. And uh, well, I could go into initiation a lot, but I want us to keep an eye on our time here. Why don't I stop there? And uh, except just to say that uh, that for Iliadi, as I've said earlier, Iliadi views modern industrial culture as uh, radically impoverished and impoverished predominantly because of its the homogen, homogenous nature of space and time in modern culture. He assumes it. He says uh, uh, that there are some traces left. Let me read you a quote. There are some traces left of sacred space, really, Adi, but nothing that really works. Quote, Yet this experience of profane space still includes values that to some extent recall the non-homogeneity peculiar to the religious experience of space. There are, for example, privileged spaces qualitatively different from all others. A man's birthplace, the scenes of his first love, or certain places in the first foreign city he visited his youth. Even for the most frankly non-religious man, all these places still retain an exceptional and unique quality. They are the, quote, holy places, unquote, of his private universe. As it were in such spot, as if it were in such spots that he received the revelation of reality other than that in which he participates in his ordinary daily life. Uh, you see this in uh, World War II vets who, who go to their uh, veterans meetings, put on their little hats, and uh, remember the sacred time and space, Normandy, and uh, and uh, and uh, the various battles. Uh, uh, that, that occurred in, in uh, the war, and that time was for them uh, sacred in the way I sense, in a very significant way. And, uh, war often functions. War and uh, violence often functions for, for people in this one. Uh, but anyway, but for him, the experience of modern industrial society is fundamentally homogeneous. And uh, he had believes then that modernity underwent a fall. There was a fall into modernity. And that human beings are shut out now from any experience of regenerative space. And uh, so what we get from Eliade, and I'll just open it up and we can discuss for 30 minutes. But what we get from Iliadi is this fundamental understanding the relationship between heterogeneity of space and regeneration in human experience. What we don't get from Iliadi is any help in understanding how it functions in contemporary culture, contemporary experience. Or that it does, much less any help in locating it or dealing with it or figuring out what the dynamics are. But that we have to turn to Victor Turner. And that's what we do next week. But let's, let's stick with the Iliadi. Make sure we understand what Iliadi is. is saying. For Iliadi, sacred does not mean God. And there are many manifestations of the sacred, a la Iliadi, in non theistic traditions. For example, I know many. Pagans, contemporary pagans, neo, what you might call neo pagans, magicians, don't believe in God. We clearly have deep understanding of sacred space. And, uh, and uh, so uh, in primitive times, I mean, in, in, in pre modern cultures, there are, there are cultures that, do, that are not theists or do not believe in a deity. Such, but which clearly had understanding of sacred time, early sense. So, uh, belief in gods was by no means consistent across pre modern cultures, but belief in the sacred, that is, some regenerative power, uh, which can be experienced, whether you call it libido or what, uh, was there. Another thing is in contemporary culture, uh, Contemporary culture simply isn't as secular as Harvey Cox and a lot of people 
back in the 60s, college. Uh, uh, the number of people who don't have some experience of uh, the transcendent, uh, whether they'll tell anybody about it or not is another issue, but uh, it's, according to, to sociological study, it's not that large. Uh, the fact is that, uh, that religious experience is common uh, in modern industrial culture as, as it just blows your mind when you read the sociological studies. Uh, and, and that includes paranormal experiences, uh, experiences we, we would call mystical or something. They're very, very widespread. And so the kind of secularity that Harvey Cox and a lot of uh, uh, university intellectuals, you know, that's where a lot of us live, and so we tend to take our questionnaires and do it on our, each other. Uh, the, kind of, the kind of secularity that, that, that was talked about at the Harvey Cox is really a figment of the imagination of the uh, upper middle class professional uh, academician. Because if you get out in the world where people live, you don't find too many people who, are, who fit the description of secular. Uh, that was so formulated back in the 60s and early 70s. I mean, it's simply a sociological joke now. For those of us that do sociological and anthropological studies of contemporary culture, we can't find all those secular people, except in the universities and a lot of you know alienated existentialists. Uh, but uh, but uh, so even in modern. Uh, it's just not as uh, secular uh, as anybody, you know, as all that rap we got when they the death of God days. Uh, it is, it is the case. But anyway, so, uh, uh, but granted, it's fragmented. It's very fragmented. That's the point. That's the very important point. When you get that, there's no containment. Containment issues are critical issues for our culture. If we don't start dealing with vessel issues and containment and container issues in this culture, we hang it up. But that's your uh, second point, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because, for example, very few religionists understand the role of denominations in this context. Denominations are vessels, containers. That's what they're supposed to be when they stop being vessels then they begin to be something very destructive. And uh, the same thing is true of congregations. Congregations in terms of religious life <clears throat> should be functioning as vessels, containers. And when they function as something other than that, they lose their they lose their reason for being. And uh, and yet very few people understand this kind of stuff enough to even be able to apply it. Like like you over there. So we're, we're the containers. Uh, now, uh, again, there are a lot, there's a lot of group work going on around the country, and there are a lot of, uh, you know, especially in this new age people who do, you know, the oasis types and the excellent types and the types that, uh, that uh, go have weekends with Gene Houston. I can think of a worse thing than a weekend with Gene Houston. But, uh, but, uh, uh, but anyway, so there are things like that happening, but granted, if you just think about most of our experience today, uh, even if, say a person is an active member of a church, the most congregations' understandings of groups don't really include this sort of dimension because uh, it's too frightening. Because, see, sacred space is where the repressed returns. Sacred space is where the opposites are no longer split. And sacred space is where you confront the minor talk. And it's where you confront the Medusa. And uh, all sorts of things. And that stuff is just, you know, I often tell my seminarians, I say, look, uh, if you ever got to where you thought that ministers were supposed to be religious leaders, it would freak a lot of people out. See, because as long as clergy 
persons preside over profane time and don't mess with sacred time. It's, it's what we call domesticating God. But if clergy persons ever started really taking seriously their role as ritual leaders, it would be a scary business to be a clergy person. It is anyway. You talk to clergy, you talk to, there are a lot of wonderful clergy around. You talk to them. It's scary business being a clergy person anyway. But the more you take this ritual dimension of, of religious leadership seriously, the scarier it gets. And uh, you can see why. Because if you really believed that you were going to help people, you were going to start trying to steward the boundaries, and uh, then it would be scary. Well, it would be, yeah, there's a hierarchical sense there. You get accused of elitism and uh, all sorts of things like that, which is not ideologically correct. It's out of sync with, uh, with Marxism, too, and, uh, which, is, which disqualifies in contemporary theological circles. But anyway, so, yeah. The current religious practice has practically no sense of initiation. I mean, you know, in the church, and look, I love the church. Don't get me wrong. I'm worried sick about it. Baptism is an initiatory right. And it doesn't anymore have that quality for most folks. <laughs> And uh, many of the other rituals in the church have initiatory significance. I just think but, well, uh, Schuler, uh, the Schuler's Crystal Cathedral. At least he under, at least he understands sacred stones, the Crystal Cathedral. <laughs> right in terms of bringing them into the congregation's life, so, because there's very little sense of boundaries. And uh, uh, <laughs> the space in the sanctuary is the same as the space out of the sanctuary, you see. And uh, there's no need for preparation to enter the sanctuary because, uh, because there's really not much difference. Uh, and, of course, Protestantism, the, uh, the Reformation, uh, View so much concern for for uh, for this distinction, this kind of distinction, is is uh, being an expression of popery, and uh, and there was a great war on on ritual practice by in, uh, you know engaged in by Protestants, and and you know you could you could argue that uh, the reasons for that, but. Uh, but uh, it has it has had a high cost because of the Protestant the tendency for Protestants to be ritually tone deaf, uh, and uh, it's a really critical thing. Other questions or comments? Some of you have had a chance to talk. Yeah. yeah. Oh yes, because uh, sort of the view of the universe as a machine. The Enlightenment uh, kind of uh, of uh, uh, picture that you get. Well, American culture was born in that uh, uh, in that period. Uh, the psyche is a machine. Uh, John Wesley, you know, the founder of Methodism, uh, uh, was very proud to view his movement as a machine, uh, the Methodist machine, call it, and. Uh, and uh, that sort of metaphor did run wild, led to corporate structures, as we know them, and so forth. And uh, these root metaphors, uh, which are used to think about human life and human experience, are so powerful. That's right, Leo. I think you're absolutely right. Uh, and it's very difficult, because what that does in psychological terms, in Jungian terms, what that does 
is to mean that you function always out of the ego. That the ego is the mechanical approach, the technical rationalism. And uh, so you get what the Jungians call a heroic ego, who thinks that every solution can be solved out of the ego position, which does not accept the necessity for an ego death. Because what we're talking about here is ego death. There's a really a dissolution, a deconstruction of the ego in the presence of the self, and a rebirth, a reconstitution of the ego because of the regenerative powers of contact with the self. And so a renewed ego structure. But you will find, uh, see, culturally modern people, this is the way culturally modern people uh, thinking live life. <laughs> so what? Yeah. I mean, and this is what Leo's talking about, about uh, the, uh, the modern uh, uh, sort of mechanist assumption about human life. You can just, uh, there is no place in there where any deconstruction must occur. In fact, if you get that, you've got a failed machine and you're crazy. So you want to know what's happening to you when you start having that stuff? Your machine just stops working right, and you're crazy. And what we need to do is give you a few drugs, get your biochemistry working right again, and then we'll have that again, and we will forget all about those strange experiences you had, and we've got these antipsychotic drugs, see, and we just did away with that. That's more of the same. And you see, what is happening to the American mental health establishment now? Heavy push on it to uh, deal with uh, human experience in that way, in this extension of this mechanism. Jungians, I'm happy to say, consider that anathema. We don't like folding, spindling, and mutilating human beings. And we do believe that uh, this ritual death is a built in part of this whole thing we're embarked on from a human life. Would you like to say a few more things about that, Leo? Uh, that's important to, to realize the resistance that people have to considering liminal states, which we'll talk about more next week, better, to consider liminal states crazy and pathological. So if you get to being in a liminal place, and, and people are not unions, you won't find too many people that, you know, that aren't either unions or influenced by Jung that, that can value that kind of crazy time uh, as a regenerative time as well. It's death and rebirth. When Kali is there, the goddess of destruction, Shiva, the god of destruction is there because there's got to be a tearing up of the old before the new can begin to germinate. Jeff, you said something about Kelly presenting the case, but not really giving us uh, the how. Well, he doesn't talk. See, the, the, I was shocked when I went, started going back through all this stuff when I was working on this, because I had assumed, I thought I remembered that Iliadi spent a lot of time talking about the way ritual leadership interfaces with sacred style aspects, but he doesn't. I finally realized I had put that together out of my studies of ritual magic and other studies. And I also realized that Turner doesn't do this much. You look at Turner's work, he doesn't emphasize the, the relationship between the importance of ritual leadership and the and the construction of liminality. No. It's, it's, in, it's implicit. It's implicit in the and implicit in Turner, but you and I, we, I mean, when we're thinking about it, we've got to get explicit about the relationship between liminal uh, transforming space and the role of man of stewardship of boundaries. Because next week, see, 
I want you to come and really talk about lemon oil as compared, as compared to lemon oil because they're not the same. They're both special space. One of them has somebody stewarding the boundaries and one of them doesn't. One of, them, one of them has got somebody watching the boundaries, and one of them doesn't. Uh, and another thing that complicates matters is you may be trying to get into liminal space, and you may have somebody that's allegedly an elder, But they may not know enough about this stuff to be able to maintain the boundaries, and so the, the space may change from liminal to liminoid. And that's what we want to talk about next week, about the difference between liminal and liminoid space in Turner's terms, and then the psychological terms, what that means. And uh, in other words, why are there so many abortions, psychological abortions? Why, why is there so much wreckage? Look around you. Oh. It's incredible how much, how many failed initiations and uh, uh, instances of people who obviously didn't get cooked. But Either that they got overcooked, they stayed in too long, can't get out. I mean, uh, and when you look around and you see that, then you realize, I mean, that folks in our country get so ill changed when it comes to this stuff. And we've got to worry about that. We've got to try to raise some consciousness about this. There are too many teenagers who are being uh, branded. Uh, What they call it, I forget my DSM three category, uh, adolescent identity disorder or something. Uh, <clears throat> well, there's a bunch, but but there are all sorts of this, all, all sorts of this DSM three categories, which translate out as people with uh, failed initiations. But what I want to point out, for us, is when kids don't get initiated properly, it isn't their fault. And when, for example, when uh, when the only way a young black male can find a male initiation is in a is in a gang on the streets of Chicago, where he has to commit a crime in order to be, become a man, there's something wrong with our cultural process. And uh, when when the primary means of initiation, for example, and you see this operates in the prisons. Our prisons are run by by gangs, and whose power, much of their power, is because they understand a lot of this stuff. They had read Turner; they just don't understand it. And uh, so we don't have any alternative initiations offered them. And. Uh, I might say pretty soon we're going to, uh, I'm happy to announce that Louise Mahdi, one of our analysts, is, has been, I've worked with her for some years now, and a number of other people. She is collecting and editing an anthology, uh, I mean a, a book, Open Court Publishing Company, on initiation, contemporary initiation, looking at these problems, looking at unwed mothers in this context and all sorts of other contemporary problems. The Vietnam War vets are another example of this. We can make warriors, but we don't know how to unmake them. We don't know how to bring them home. Pre-industrial tribes knew how to make warriors, and they knew how to unmake warriors. And we just remember the first part. If you've been taught to be an efficient killer in Vietnam, 
There are a lot of young men running around here in these VA hospitals and running around the streets that have never been turned off. That can't go back to ordinary experience. So it's a critical issue. It's just not an academic topic. Other comments? We got a few minutes. Some of you that haven't had a chance to say. You have a sense for the young man? This is me. But I was wondering, I know Eliade did mention Plato. Right. It, it's obvious that uh, that uh, Jung stands in that Platonic tradition, and um, uh, I mean, he would be much more comfortable in the kind of Platonic tradition. Uh, and uh, it's obvious that uh, a lot of people feel that, that the Aristotelian tradition did come did come up through Aquinas uh, and on into uh, the development into uh, what later began to be technical reason. A lot of people would feel that there was trans in that way. I think you can overdo that. I don't think that you can reduce this to the war between Plato and Aristotle and all that kind of thing. I think that uh, um, I think that uh, that uh, that's a very complicated piece of intellectual history there. I would appreciate that much. Well, see, he lived in a culture where that was assumed. A lot of people forget when they're studying Plato and so forth in philosophy departments is that the Plato you get in philosophy departments is a Plato that's been strained and cleaned up uh, and has been secularized, uh, taken out of this context. Uh, whereas, you know, they a lot of they take out all the mystical craziness out of Plato when they teach it a lot of universities. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, uh, what you got to remember is this is Greece, and this is a world where uh, the gods were very much alive in popular consciousness. And so this is a, this is a secular uh, University of America where he's writing. So it's complicated with knowing how to interpret that. I think I would defer to Leo on that. Uh, you want to comment on that, Leo? Um, another comment. I don't think you can make it into the platonic aspect of I have a friend that just went to the birthplace of Zeus, to the cave, the birthplace of Zeus. It's very strict and about it. So, I mean, it really was a very meaningful experience for him to go down into the cave and be where Zeus allegedly was born. Yeah, it didn't. He wasn't born in front of him. Well, 
and you lost your ego batteries. Participación mystique. And that is what the meaning of this stuff is. When you're in sacred space, your ego boundaries are not what they used to be. <laughs> and you're able to, your, your boundaries inside the space, your own boundaries are much more permeable. He speaks to the point of the Finding Yes, found space. So that moment where the experience of found space. That's right. That's right. 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 I want you to be thinking now this week, and we don't want to wait around, we we'll be thinking around about your experiences of liminoid, return it, experience of liminoid space, that is, extraordinary space that's not got careful attention to the boundaries. That's your vacation time, your so forth and so on. Vegas. Vegas is the preem preeminent example for middle class, lower middle class America of uh, of liminoid space. Tahoe. What are some others? Frank Sinatra. That's right. He's one of the devas. Right. He's one of the devas. And uh, uh, it's no accident you see that uh, Sarat Rush Street. Exactly. Rush Street. Liminoid. Uh, Mount Shasta. Jerusalem. Pilgrimage is not liminal. It's liminal. Because you don't have a ritual steward. You see, what we will learn as we go on is, you see, if you're going to cook, you really got to be in the space and the heat's got to be turned up. And the problem is, if there's nobody running this show, you can get too close to the fire. Sometimes when people go to Vegas for liminal experiences, that's what happens. They get a little too close to the fire. This is what happens when people get over their head in drugs, over their head in alcohol. Um, we'll go into the various ways in which you can self-destruct looking for liminality in liminoid forms. See, liminality is your contained, secured boundaries where real transformation can occur. Uh, liminoid space is what, what happens that you will see uh, when in modernity, liminality is fragmented and people still are wired. They are biologically grounded. You, you've got this biological urge when you're when you when you open your organism knows that it's time. It starts wanting a boundary. You've got almost it's almost like you have a boundary shaped place in you know in the organism. And people will start hunting a boundary. So they'll go to the seashore. Or they'll go to the mountains. Or they'll go to the forest. Or they'll go to the socially marginal. They'll find a boundary by getting working with the poor. Finding a metaphorical boundary. The marginal. Finding the margin. Don't know what they're doing though. Most of the time, it's, it's an edge. They got to scratch it, but it's not transformative in those cases. So that's the kind of thing we've got to be looking at. So you be thinking now for next week, return, be thinking about your own experience. Think about your own initiation as a woman or as a man. how well or how badly it was handled. 
And uh, and think about your own what you do for liminoid experiences. And then we'll talk about that next time. The following week we'll get a lot deeper into that, sharing our experiences. In the final session we'll talk about the special version that we call analysis. Okay. Okay, this is fun for me. I really enjoy this because it's fascinating stuff. Thank you for coming. To do a little uh, introductory uh, uh, presentation on this, then I want us to to look carefully at uh, this distinction that uh, Turner makes between liminal and liminoid, and uh, I want us to save time to discuss <clears throat> experiences that uh, that you uh, might put within these different categories. Um, uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about what some of the limitations, I think, uh, are of Turner. This, uh, <clears throat> this material that I'm presenting <clears throat> comes from a chapter in a book I've just co-edited entitled uh, Anthropology and a Study of Religion, uh, edited by uh, uh, Frank Reynolds of the Divinity School, University of Chicago, and me. Frank is a historian of religion. Anyway, let me just say a little bit about uh, about Victor Turner. Um, in my mind, Victor Turner uh, was quite clearly the most important cultural anthropologist uh, of uh, of this time, uh, and there are many reasons for that. He was only 63 when he died in December, and he was entering what was to be undoubtedly uh, an uh, important new creative phase in his work, which might have had a, a large impact on the problem of uh, world culture because he was trying to find ways in which the different cultures of the world could learn to appreciate each other by uh, appropriation of dramatic forms, uh, drop, use of drama to participate in the fundamental root metaphors of each other's world culture, I mean, each other's uh, culture in the world. And he was working on this a lot. And he had uh, the book from, uh, from Ritual to Theater that he wrote not long before his death is something you should look at. He had also done with his wife, Edie, uh, a lot of work on pilgrimage. The, uh, the anthropological understanding of pilgrimage and, his, and their book, The Image and Pilgrimage in, in Christian Culture, is one of the finest pieces of work you will ever find on the nature and meaning of pilgrimage. Uh, there, and another little book, uh, Process, Performance, and Pilgrimage, uh, elaborated his ideas on this. And of course, you know, there's many other works uh, uh, that uh, listed. Uh, on the back, I think, probably, of this ritual process. So the ritual process book is the book to begin with if you're going to read Turner, because it gets you into these fundamental ideas we'll be discussing tonight. He called his work proce Processual Symbolic Analysis. And he discussed the kind of things he was interested in as comparative symbology by which he hoped to help people understand the meaning involved in social process and the relationship between the individual and the cultural setting in which the individual was functioning. As you know from reading this, he picked up on the pioneering work of Arnold Van Gennep and uh, the, in the rites of passage and carried it forward to elaborate on the dynamics of the kind of experience that occurs in rites of passage. Van Gennep had described the tripartite uh, structure of rites of passage. Turner took that work and then deepened it and gave it a far more sensitive and dynamic treatment. 
getting more into what it's like to be inside a transition state. Now, as you remember last week when I when I pointed out this uh, thing on the back of the first this thing from Levinson's Seasons of a Man's Life, I pointed out that uh, in the experience of sacred space is very likely something that is experienced at transitions times, transitional times. But no one before or since Turner has paid as much attention to transition states and this unique kind of being, this unique kind of world that exists inside a transition state. Now, that is to say, nobody has done it systematically and thought as carefully about it. That's not to say human beings haven't always known it, because they've always known it. And that's why I put on the back here uh, something from uh, Joseph Campbell's Hero with a Thousand Faces, because this is the, this is the cycle of uh, leaving. You could plot this. You, this is parallel to the, uh, to the uh, chart that I've got lined up linearly. This is, le this is the first threshold. Uh, threshold crossing to get, to get in. You find the call to get into uh, sacred space. And then this time in the underworld, the belly of the beast. And then the crossing of the second threshold back into an incorporation into the profane world. That is the ordinary world the world of what Victor Turner calls structure. Now, in a few minutes, we're going to get into Turner's rap on this. But you see, in the mythological traditions, you've got this. Uh, every culture has got this cycle. You can see it. That's because we Jungians think uh, the human being is wired for this stuff. And uh, so no matter what culture you're in or what particular cultural uh, materials, mythological uh, patterns accrue to it, this structure is fundamental to human experience. It is paradigmatic to human experience. And we go through this night sea journey many times in our lives, some journeys smaller than others, some of them uh, less dangerous than others, but we go through this cycle many times. Uh, that's why the image of initiation has been so key to so many different traditions and the idea is indeed that there are many steps in the initiatory process because there are so many things you have to, there's so many times you have to go through uh, transition states. So, uh, human beings have always known it. Van Gannett outlined it, and Turner really got down into it and looked very carefully at it and began to come up with a way of thinking systematically about it to get us to look at this kind of experiencing and uh, its role in human culture. Now, if you were going to plot this Appendix 2 on our first sheet, what you would have to do to make this look right would put would be to put put it like this. Liminality is the middle phase, and there would be a status system before and after. There would be state one and state two, partiality one and partiality two. See, that is to say, we could take this list of characteristics and put in, in the middle on our first handout. And the status system, which is characteristic of profane space, all profane space, operates according to the status system characteristics. And so the status system list would go in both phase one and phase three on the handout. So in other words, you would move from your first position in structure, child, to your second position in structure, which would be post-initiation, adult. And, uh, uh, or 
fate won prior to the death of a very important loved one. State two, the radically different world of life without that person. Or state one, before the divorce. State two, after you've gotten over the crazy time, after the divorce. So, uh, now let's look carefully at these distinctions that Turner makes. Now, Turner believed that it was only in pre-industrial cultures that you got liminality really clear, clear and integrated liminality. And he believed that that was because, and I do not agree with him about this, but he, agree, he believed that that was because the whole tribe could do this together. So in other words, in his view, when you got really an integrated experience of liminality, of transition, this transitional sacred world, that it was because the whole culture participated in it together, like the Pueblo Indians and their initiations, or Navajo, or, or the Australian Aboriginal uh, tribes that we read about in Stanner's book on uh, Australian Aboriginal initiation, um, and that Eliade has been so influenced by. Um, but so Turner really believed that, it, that this was only, that Turner believed that the only time you could really use the word liminality and really have it mean what you were saying was when it was applied to tribal or pre-industrial uh, culture. Now. I'll be saying a little bit later why I think he was wrong about that. But let's just take that for a minute. And let's look at this, uh, at these, uh, ca these characteristics. Turner discusses what he calls structure. And by structure, he means the kind of set and modalities of social relationships which exist in what we have called here, following Iliadi, profane space. That is, their preoccupation with who you are, your identity, in Erickson's terms, in Jungian terms, persona issues. Persona issues are extremely important in structure. Uh, you are in structure who they say you are and, and where you meet where who you are and the confirming society says you are meets. That's what you are in structure. Uh, this is what uh, uh, I think uh, feminists refer to is, as the social organization of hierarchy. Because in states of structure, hierarchy is, and it is blessed. And Ritual forms, now that's using the word ritual loosely, ritual forms, characteristic of structure, are what Turner calls ceremonial. They bless the status quo. And so when you have uh, uh, liturgical events in structure, in profane space and time, they are blessing the status quo ante and supporting the hierarchical relations that are present and the personal identifications and statuses characteristic of that. Marriage is a, is a uh, trait of structure. Marriage, uh, degrees, professionalism, America is very, very uh, interesting on this because uh, someone was telling me that they, you know, they just spent a lot of time in Europe, that when he was in Greece or when he was in Italy or when he was in France, he'd be around talking with people in restaurants and something, and they never ask him, what do you do? They ask him, what do you think about such and such? Or how do you feel about such and such? They, they related to this man, this dear friend of mine, who who is a lovely man, but they, they didn't think about what he did for a living. No one ever asked him what he did for a living. 
Whereas in America, you go to a uh, social gathering or something, and one of the first things they want to do is to locate you on the, on the structure pole. They want to ask you, well, what do you do? And then they've got a pigeonhole for you, and they do not have to pay any attention to anything except persona, you see. Once they get you nailed in the persona, they think they got you. Uh, so, so that is what Turner's talking about in terms of structure. Uh, modern culture, you see, we're the most modern culture. Modernity has been brought to its highest focus in American culture. And uh, therefore, it's interesting that, that you get such a clear sense of the, of the uh, state of hierarchy. See, in, in Europe, the structure is there and is written in granite, too. But there have always been all these little places where what Turner calls communitas leaks out. And uh, Parisian cafes is one of them, you know. Uh, so anyway, but look what happens when you get into transition states. Let's just look carefully at these and the radical kind of difference that exists in a state of liminality. And I suggest that you think about people's bizarre forms of religiosity in this context. I mean, if you've read my uh, cult experience book, you know that I use this schema to understand what has gone on with the minority religions, or so-called cults, the participation in, a, in what is often called a cult is an experience of liminality. And you will find a lot of these traits, the traits that people uh, are attacked for manifesting in cults are the traits of liminality. Totalism. You know, we have a lot of people that write about totalism and thought. What a horrible thing it is. And, uh, and the tendency to have regimentation in cults or in initiatory groups like Aboriginal initiation or marine boot camp. Uh, you you uh, dress alike, and you wear your hair alike, and you do not emphasize differences of status. You're, you wear blue jeans. I mean, hippie culture. Hippie culture was a sort of a form of, uh, of, of this sort of stuff breaking out in American culture. And the uniform was Right. Communitas is an important term for Turner, and it means that kind of social relationship which focuses on uh, equality of people and uh, their uh, lack of differences. It's very warm, one-to-one, -one, direct. Uh, it is the kind of experience that occurs to people when they are in New York City and the lights go out. Mm -hmm. What happens when a catastrophe comes along, and you see all sorts of these catastrophe movies, the big theme is what happens to the social reality when a catastrophe hits? Because all of a sudden, there isn't any status anymore. They're just human beings in it together. And that is communitas, yes. Interesting you mentioned New York. We were there when the tall ships were there on the 4th of July, and it was that same thing for that whole weekend. There was no, everybody was buddies, and we're all walking down the street hugging each other, and it was okay. fun. And we've been to New York before, and it's clear. Right. Boston on the 4th of July, 1976. The same way. And you. You can, one thing we ought to do is talk about the experiences you've had of communitas. Because, see, communitas and liminality do not always overlap. It's one of the things you need to be clear about. Communitas can't be controlled. It just happens. It just breaks out. It is not, it is not always under anybody's leadership. In fact, a lot of the time it isn't. It just sort of breaks out through the cracks in the social 
structure and experience. But that's that's an example. You know, you see the uh, the Poseidon adventure, or whatever the films are. You know, and the, something happens, and then everybody cooperates, and they take risks for each other, and and uh, willing to die for each other, and they. It, it's just a radical different kind of thing. Another another kind of experience which uh, w in which you see this communitas break out is on pilgrimages. If you ever go on pilgrimage, it's sort of like going on vacation, but it's not quite the same. You like to think you have a little communitas on vacations. Sometimes you do and sometimes you don't. The problem with that is that so many people see their vacations as an extension of a status structure. In other words, is my vacation more prestigious than your vacation? And so they're still locked into uh, the, the, the mind of structure when they go on their vacation. And so they don't experience communitas. And it's no accident that they don't experience communitas because they're having a more prestigious vacation. I mean, and as long as you're into prestige, you can't really be into communitas because prestige is like oil against water. It just, you know, if you're into that, you cannot possibly participate in this other social reality. Okay. But once when I was studying a group of occultists, I, uh, I got myself invited to go along on a pilgrimage from Chicago to uh, their Mecca in, uh, in uh, Southern California. And it was a caravan of the members of this particular group from the Chicago area. And it was quite clear to me that there was this radical difference kind of social space created by this embarking off to the center of their universe, the Axis Mundi, and uh, a sort of a little Hajj, or pilgrimage to Mecca. And as we drove across the country, I began to notice that the difference in state, they knew who I was, they knew I was studying them, and this sort of thing. But, I, but the differences in social status and, and intentionality and so forth began to just sort of dissolve. Any anthropologist that has studied pilgrimage will tell you this, has been on pilgrimage. When you get on pilgrimage, you're on pilgrimage, and it affects your mind. And what happens to you when you do this is that bonding occurs. You get attachment, and it's across all boundaries. You notice this on the pilgrimage to Mecca. Because on pilgrimage to Mecca, people rub shoulders together and eat together and talk with each other and share and so forth. They would never speak to each other at any other time in their lives. And uh, a bond developed between me and these people on, on this uh, journey that's never dissolved. It's very spooky unless you understand these things, because once you understand these things, uh, uh, you realize if you ever go on pilgrimage with somebody, there will always be a bond. Always. No matter if you think they're all psychotics. I mean, uh, some of the people on this in this group were fr quite frankly crazy, but I love them dearly. What happens if someone's on a pilgrimage like that? Turn them onto them. Get into it. You can't. You can't. You're drawn in. No, no. That's what I'm. That's the point. This. This is. This is a psychosocial reality, and a social scientist who is in a, this kind of psychosocial reality will be influenced by them. I mean, that's, the point, that's Turner's point. You read this book on image and pilgrimage in Christian culture, and they, they talk about this kind of thing. It's not as clear as it, it should be about that, but, but it's really true. And the same thing is true as you have some of these other spontaneous experiences of communitas. If you're in some sort of tragedy, uh, with a group of people. There will always be a bond. And it goes way down deep in you. Now this is the kind of thing, according to Turner, communitas is really the glue of the world. He says really without a communitas you can hang it all up because it is out of this, these cracks in this structural system that the sources of healing come for the person and the sources of healing for the culture and the world come. And, you know, the problem is people think, you know, do-gooders, 
which we all could probably count ourselves among, tend to think you can control this thing. We're going to have institutionalized communitas. <laughs> Call it normative communitas. That's what Turner calls it. For economists, for example, <coughs> their real intention is to institutionalize communitas. They don't uh, use that language. Uh, yeah, the communists intend to institutionalize communitas. Of course, if you look at communist states, there's nothing more eaten up with structure than Russian society. There's nothing more structurally authoritarian and uh, based on status hierarchies than, uh, than most of the communist societies. However, they have this vision of a normative communitas which is enforced. The only problem about a communitas, you can't enforce it. You can't enforce it. You can't create it. You can't enforce it. It just sneaks up on you and uh, happens to you. Uh, and that, that to Turner, was a treme is tremendous the important thing to realize that, that it is out of these cracks in the structural hierarchy that uh, that this glue comes which holds things together and which renews things. Now that is related. The idea that you can't c control communitas is related to an idea which we will be talking about time and again. You can't control sacred space. The most knowledgeable ritual elder cannot control sacred space. Any ritual elder who knows anything about this knows that he or she can't. They can spoil it. You can spoil communitas, and you can spoil sacred space. You can invoke it. You can welcome it. You can be open to it when it comes. You can place yourself in places where it may happen, but you cannot create it. And uh, so uh, there is the tie between communitas and sacred spaces, and neither one of them can be controlled. It is very much like what Christians have always talked about, about the spirit flows where it will. Now it's here, and now it's gone, and there's no control. Okay, let's look down here some more through these. Hmm. Sexual continents are community. One of the things that you can tell about these liminal states is, is that uh, there is either uh, abstinence from sexuality, we know it as celibacy in certain Christian traditions, or there is sexual community, communal living uh, uh, that we heard about so much in the 60s, uh, group uh, particular groups that emphasize sexual community. Uh, you may think of the Oneida community and other uh, religious communities throughout history that had that practiced some form of sexual community. In other words, the sexual expression in transition states is not like it is ordinarily in structure. So whatever the sexual relationship is in structure in this particular society, it won't be the same in a transition state. Now, in our society, it means the, the norm still, even though under great uh, pressure, the norm still is uh, marriage. You can tell something's going on when there's a shift in sexual behavior. There may be sexual acting out, that is, affairs or uh, uh, homosexual or heterosexual affairs, so forth. or there may be impotence or frigidity. See? We almost never think about those things as having anything to do with anything. It's just, you know, well, this person got sexual problems. You know? uh, but the way I read these things is that uh, that sexual acting out and or frigidity and impotence are usually signs of the presence of a transition state, whether it's recognized or not. And uh, the important thing just is just to put on put on your eyebrow up in there, watching when you're paying attention to these things as you observe people and and uh, things going on around you and in you, is when you start seeing deviate deviations 
from the sexual norms, you think, well, liminality. Some liminality either trying to happen here or, or happening here, conscious or unconscious. Yeah. Liminal states are the characteristics of liminal states are thus, by virtue of being liminal states, in other words, they're opposites, it's not an ideological commitment, for example. It's simply the opposite of what is normal. Or it may not be the opposite, it just is, it, it, is, it is something that tears down structure. Just by virtue of being that. Just by virtue of deviating from the norms and patterns of structure. Uh, now, there are probably, very probably, we would say, psychological archetypal basis for these things. For example, let me just do you a little Jungian thing here with this now. You see, if you're Jungian, you view phase two here as the realm when the unconscious manifests itself more clearly without repression, all right? And what do you get when you're in a transition state and you're really disoriented? Well, you get the archetypal patterns manifesting themselves a lot more clearly. You know, people say, wow, I had an archetypal dream. Like it's something good. Well, an archetypal dream isn't something good. I mean, it means you're right in the middle of the belly of the whale is what it means. It means that, it means that you're needing help from the axis mundi to keep any kind of orientation. And so... Uh, the the manifestation of sexual, quote, perversions, now this is Bob Moore, not Victor Turner here. In my view, the manifestation of sexual perversions, so-called, is an opening of the door to the unconscious uh, archetypal patterns which are characteristic of transition states. In other words, an example of that is uh, anal intercourse between men is a classical initiatory activity involved in the initiation of young males, many tribes. So what a lot of people would just say, well, that's just homosexual acting out or something. If you're thinking out of this kind of point of view informed by Turner, and you're doing a psychoanalytic uh, uh, interpretation of what Turner's talking about, or putting psychoanalytic interpretation under the umbrella of this ritual schema, then you say, ah, what these people call perversions are really very meaningful phenomena which have to do with what needs to get incarnated in some way in order for a transition to be made, a significant transition. And so, uh, so all I'm saying about the sexual, the uh, the sexual thing there is that is that in structure, or we might say the world of the ego and the persona, usually things are organized in a more socially acceptable form, and all cultures have certain strictures about sexual behaviors that say what is normative. And if you get a culture that can't say anything about what is normative, about sexuality, you know, free love and nickel beer or whatever, nickel love and free beer, uh, you don't have a, a society. What you've got is chronic liminality, which I want to talk about a, a good bit tonight. The concept, don't let me forget it, because I want to talk about the concept of chronic liminality, which is when you got in, you can't get out. And, uh, okay. Minimization of sex differences, unisex, um, in various ways, typically is a, uh, can be an expression of the sexual uh, manifestations of liminality. Humility on the part of uh, everyone in a liminal phase. The humility meaning uh, that you're not into lording it over people at this point. In fact, you may be very submissive at this point. In fact, clinically, you may be masochistic. Because in my judgment, masochism 
is another expression of a desire for some form of ritual leadership in such a state. And I mean, I mean masochism, you know, the really bizarre kind, you know, beat me. Kind of masochism. So, perjury. Are you using humility and like submissiveness? I'm using that as one expression of, uh, of, well, see, Turner talks about humility. And I'm extending that personally to say that that carries forward beyond some, some sort of uh, being nice, although um, part of the humility, the, the sort of surface part of the humility is the desire to be equal with everybody. We don't want to lord it over. You know, we, 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 We've been stripped. We've had all of our status stripped away. So all of our things that would give us with the right to lord it over anybody has been stripped away. So that's the sort of surface of it. But beneath that, is also a desire to submit. When one is in a liminal state, to the extent that one is really in it dynamically, uh, there is a desire to submit. And what the Freudians call uh, very often, particularly in men, passive homosexual uh, rape fantasies. That is, receptive fantasies. And if you get somebody, you're working with somebody, as I often do, that is having, that is being frightened to death because of, of fantasies of either rape or, or uh, whether they're males or females, um, or sort of a, a man that is into uh, fantasies of being, uh, of, of having someone have anal intercourse with him. It's very often a manifestation dynamically of this, this, this psychic quest for for uh, receptivity, submission. If you study world religions, you'll find that submission is a very powerful theme. Islam means submission. And of course, today, submission, in modernity, submission has a bad name. Because the idea is, if you know, if you say we must submit, it means you're wanting to have slavery over us. But, but that's why it's so important to understand materials like Turner's, because if you don't understand this stuff, then you can't understand why human beings get into wanting to submit. And, uh, and then people decide that it is good not to submit. Always to be autonomous. Well, if you get somebody that's always autonomous, you got somebody that's crazy. It's going to be crazy the rest of their lives if they can't submit, because if you cannot submit, you cannot die. You cannot die. You can't get reborn. But anyway, let's let's move on through this. Would have a little connection with uh, head injuries caused by inflation. Yeah. Say a little bit about inflation. Well, inflation and elevation. That's just that thing. If the ego is too inflated. Yeah, I'm going to stay in structure for the rest of my life. In other words, the, the heroic ego. I'm going to stay in structure. I'm not going to have any experiences of liminality, right? No conversion experiences for me. No night sea journeys for me. I don't believe in that stuff. I'm a Freudian. There are no, 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 no communitas. No communitas. Uh, if, you, if you get into this communitas fantasy, you're just trying to return to the womb. I mean, this is a regressive, uh, this is a regressive, passive, uh, fantasy of, of, uh, of getting lost back into the uh, oceanic feelings of the mother and you have not adequately you have not adequately severed the bond with the mother and you were sometimes damaged somewhere in the rapprochement phase of your early object relations development so forth and so on and so if you have this longing to return to the womb you're crazy and if we can just get the right ego development in you by some good psychoanalytic psychotherapy, or, or if you um, have enough money, psychoanalysis proper, five days a week, uh, we could get you to the point that you didn't have that feeling. And of course, the Freudian analyst does not realize that coming to see him five days a week is precisely the experience of the night sea journey for this person anyway, 
And uh, there's a quest for a sort of a stripping and humility. If you don't think that psychoanalysis, the experience of psychoanalysis manifests those things, just look. If you're in Freud analysis, you learn about your homosexuality, you, you know, you learn about your bisexuality, you know, you, you deal with all that stuff in your dreams, uh, they take your money to the point that you, <laughs> that you have absence of property, <laughs> you know. <laughs> And uh, so, I mean, but I'm serious. I mean, the experience of Freudian analysis is quite clearly an experience of Freudian analysis. You get a real sense of the, the, the detail. See how, much more, see how much more specific his discussion of this is. And if you read his books, you get so much more of a feel of this, what it's really like, what the patterns that are characteristic of sacred space are, behavior in sacred space than you do anywhere else. Nobody was ever that specific about these things or brought these together and showed how you could look around human culture and find these things. Nobody else ever did that before time. Now, to, let me talk just a few more minutes about liminoid, and then we'll discuss this stuff. Uh, oh, I wanted to point out that... that yeah, I, want, I will talk about that in a minute. Acceptance of pain and suffering. Well, you know, why is it people want to hurt themselves in transition states? Why is it that you get people burning themselves with cigarettes? Well, it could be just a failure of the machine, if you have certain views of human beings. If you have a view of human being that they are, that they evolved so that ritual process is necessary to be human and that they're wired to understand need for certain things and they get into a place where they need to have a transformation, a metamorphosis of the ego into some higher, more mature state, then the body and the psyche, the unconscious, knows something about what it needs. It knows, I need to die. I need to die. So I'll kill myself. They don't have a ritual elder around to tell them, yeah, you need to die, but it's the old ego that needs to die. You know, Suicide in the Soul, the Hillman book. The same thing about ritual mutilation. They know they need to be wounded. They know they need to experience pain. They know they need to be scarred. The psyche knows. I need to be scarred. I need to be burned. So it literalizes it. So they burn their skin with cigarettes. They don't understand the archetypal imagery of cooking in the fire. They don't understand the archetypal imagery of being wounded by lance, as in Iron Hans, uh, or Iron Hans. And the, uh, the, the necessitas of being wounded to be transformed. And nobody tells them. They just think they're crazy. So they burn themselves. And so the psyche is trying to do what it knows it needs to do, but nobody there to dance with. Okay. Now, liminoid. See, Turner thought that in modernity all you get is this so fragmented liminality that there's not really any limit, truly liminal experience in, in modern industrial culture. Liminoid phenomena are like play, leisure, drama, uh, going on vacations, uh, sports, hobbies, that sort of thing. It has the characteristic of not being society-wide, usually involved commercially, you buy it, it's sort of voluntary associations. And uh, some people have decided that psychotherapy is liminoid because you pay for it, the idea you pay for it. It's not society-wide. And, uh, uh, I mean, there's, there's an article in, uh, in the Zygon issue by a Freudian friend of mine who thinks that. Uh, but anyway, liminoid, the distinction that I make, see, I think Turner is, is wrong the way he makes the distinction between liminal and liminoid. I think that liminal space always has a elder, ritual elder involved, stewarding the boundaries, keeping the vessel hot. If the boundaries of sacred space are too permeable, you can't get it hot enough. 
to have a transfer. An actual or a hope for a virtual. Right, right. An actual, <clears throat> right. It may, it may not be a copy. Right, right. Could be. But uh, I tend to believe that truly liminal space truly transformative space, truly sacred space in the sense that primitives used it in that way, uh, relating to personal transformations anyway, has to have ritual leadership. Uh, now, as you point out, there may be in some, there are in some instances inner guides that can bring this off. But we would be really out of line to to lead people to hope for transformations based on inner guides without any outer guides. Well, I'm just thinking of sort of the unconscious line search that right. You know that there may be some subliminal hope that. There's oh, there's always that hope. You know, there's so. always that hope, and my my sense is that that is what's behind liminal experience. That the psyche sends people off looking for regeneration. And they, there is a wish for a elder. And sometimes you can find somebody uh, that will play that role for you who is not a knowledgeable elder, but who knows, just knows how to dance. And they can be sensitive to you, what you need, and they can be there for you. And, and you find this with children. Uh, a child is a very good example of this. A child goes through all these transitions all the time. And they know what they need in an adult. And if there are adults around who are really sensitive and, and sort of healthy, that kid will line them up and get up there and rub up against and just <laughs> suck just what they need out of that adult in ritualization and dance. They'll get out of that adult what they need in terms of the enactment right then. If that adult is not out to lunch, you know, and emotionally unavailable, you know, if that adult had any kind of decent experiences where they can really be, be with a kid, if you can be with a child, uh, that child, in an uncanny way, knows what that child needs. And that child will pull it out of you. You'll find your instinctual repertoire coming online as you as you give that child what that child needs even though you didn't even know you knew that's what that child needed well it's uh well but it's not just that it's more like winnicott it's more like uh erickson uh <laughs> mr rogers might well have done that but anyway so 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 human beings of all ages are this way and if you can find somebody who is, they got that kind of sensitivity. Uh, they may not know they're playing the role of ritual elder at all, and often don't. But, but with, a, with a real sensitivity, a human being will extract what is needed if, if there's some kind of, that, kind of, uh, that kind of presence there. Uh, but still, in my view, that's kind of hit and miss and dangerous because uh, you can latch on to somebody that doesn't know how to dance. And... Uh, you can interject, see a child interjects a lot, and uh, a child also in the situations can also interject a lot of poisonous or toxic, toxic uh, things that way. Um, in other words, the parallel is you can get a crazy analyst, you can get a crazy therapist, and uh, so even if you got somebody that's advertising themselves as a ritual elder, trained, certified by the Jung Institute or the Adler Institute or the Freudian Institute, Psychoanalytic Institute, you may have a you may have a crazy ritual elder who who won't be able to help you either. I mean, so there's no guarantees on this. But anyway, so uh, next week uh, is when I want you to come in. I want you all to write out a page. Type it if you can type. On your observations of people searching out transformative space, what are the ways you've seen people try to do this? Now, they may be like going to Vegas. 
like we said last week, which is liminoid. There's no real official elder. And the distinction I make is that in liminal space, you've always got that magic circle of some, and set up in some way. There is a boundary, a clear boundary, and it's all the way around. It's like the alchemical vase. That's why the mandala has been looked at as so important. It is a symbol for this containment. Now, when you're into liminoid experiences, you don't find the boundary into the carefully delimited space. What you do is you find you go to the boundary, the seashore, the mountain, the desert. You go live with the poor, which is a search for the boundary in terms of social status. And so hence the magical significance of the poor for so many people. Why do people go work with the poor when they're in transition states? It's a common pattern. See somebody get into a transition state? They'll go to Appalachia. They'll go to the Peace Corps. They'll go to the mission field. They'll go to Nicaragua. You know. But it is a quest for the boundary, see? Because sure enough, if you go to the south of the border, you're trying to find that boundary. And you're looking for a psychosocial boundary. The only problem is there very probably isn't a mandala down there. There is, there's probably not a magic circle with a ritual elder that knows how to get you in and out. There may be. You never know. But see, going on pilgrimage, see, pilgrimages are, according to Turner, are liminoid, not liminal, because you don't need a ritual elder to have a pilgrimage. All you need is a holy place. You go to Mecca. You go through the motions and come back. You may get transformed on a pilgrimage. Then again, you may not. Uh, so journeys to the boundary in search of a door into a sacred space see your psyche knows you need a boundary your psyche knows you got to get to the edge got to get to that threshold but if it doesn't if you don't understand this business you'll think the psyche will just lead you on a quest I love that movie Close Encounters at Third Cat there was so much about sacred space in that movie. If you want to, if you want to, to, to have, you should. This is a good assignment. Get you if you got one of those. What do you call them? The VCRs. Get close encounters of third can and watch it. Got the sacred mountain. Got the appearance of the gods at the center, and you've also got this subliminal imprinting of the place you need to go. And that's what I'm talking about. There is a subliminal imprinting of the place you need to go when you get the need to have to get healed, a transition state. You get to know you need to be transformed. So what I want you to do next week is to come in with your own notes. We'll share with each other what you have observed in other people and yourself about when you have needed whether you realized it or not at the time, when you, re when you needed to metamorph, what spatial acting out did you do? A spatial act travel is a spatial acting out of this thing. What it does on liminoid experience, it is really sacred. It's, it, it is sacred space. It's not liminality. See, sacred space is either liminal or liminoid. The liminoid feeds you. You get in touch with something in liminoid space. You get in touch with sacrality. It is different. There is a nourishment there, and it is an intimation. It's what Peter Berger calls its rumors of angels. <laughs> See? You you sense that there really is hope. And you know, human beings are tough. They don't need much to be able to hope. I mean, when you get people that are really, really gone, they haven't been getting much anything. And so this liminoid experiencing gives them, it feeds you a little bit, and gets you enough strength to keep on going. And, of course, Jungians think about all of this in terms of individuation, right? And in individuation, there are many of these night sea journeys, right? So what you need is a charge once in a while to keep going. 
and the psyche is working its thing in you and it is guiding you around through these experiences and there is a larger transformation underneath these smaller ones, incremental ones, that's going on. And I think for most people, they're forced into this kind of experience that you're talking about because there are so few places one can go and, and be contained. A lot of people, see that's why a lot of people hospitalize themselves. I mean, Yes, oh, mental hospital. Mental hospital is really liminal space. And it, the only way to really understand mental hospitals is this way. Too bad the mental health establishment didn't understand it this way. If, they, if, 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 if psychiatry would study Turner, you'd have a different kind of psychiatry. But it's clear. A person says, okay, going on like this isn't going to do. I'm going to hospitalize myself. And they go in. A lot of, well, the problem is, usually, as he says, usually they're not any knowledgeable elders. They're just psychiatrists. <laughs> See, but that doesn't mean to say there are not any that aren't, because I know, you know, there are psychiatrists that are ritual elders. And uh, there are little, there are, there are little BA type people that are hired by the state, you know, to save money that are good at it. I mean, there are a lot of good folks that do this. It's just that, you, that we ought to be able to expect better. But, right, right, right. Like, you know, I once, I once sat with a, uh, with a uh, druggist who was a member of a small minority religious group as he worked with a paranoid schizophrenic young man. And he was marvelous. I, I was scared to death because this guy was 6'6 six, six and 240 pounds and he was having, having fantasies about how he used to be an SS trooper and you know, he, 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 you know this kind of thing. And I was, he had invited me to go along for this and so I went along to watch it. And, uh, but I was amazed that this sort of druggist who on his spare time works with people as a ritual leader he worked with this guy and it was I just couldn't believe it. Much better than most of the PhD and MD psychotherapists I've ever seen. Uh, so there are these folks around. But we don't think about mental illness in anthropological terms. Although there are more and more people beginning to. Medical anthropology is a growing field. And of course, the places where it's really growing are places like San Antonio where you get the people in the medical center down there studying with the Brujos. And the Brujos and the, and the uh, medical doctors down there in the psychiatry department are studying you know, the, the, uh, the native, the native uh, healers. And uh, so, so this is coming. It's got to come. But in the meanwhile, it's a lot of, a lot of sadness because people know what they need part of them. They're unconscious knows what they need. Other questions or comments? We got a little time. Yeah. Is, I just thought of something. Is there, is there a network of people who believe as you do and who have some knowledge about where the shamans or healers uh, are, the people who really are effective no matter what the degrees are? And secondly, is there a journal? <laughs> yeah, just the chairman seems to vote these things. I was just thinking, should there, ought, there not, ought there not to be a journal called say transformation? Devoted to this kind of thing. Well, that, that's a that's a fascinating idea. I, I there are a lot of people around the world now that are interested in this. And uh, let me just give a commercial for uh, a book that will be coming out soon, uh, edited by one of our own here, Louise Mati. And uh, Louise has been doing a very creative, exciting thing. Um, she is one of the people that knows most of the people around the world that are into this. And uh, she has edited this book that the, we don't know what the final title will be, but it's The Archetype of Initiation. And she has brought together papers uh, from people around the world on uh, masculine initiation, feminine initiation, initiatory aspects of various, uh, uh, of various experiences in life. And that should be coming out with open court sometime next year. So there are people, but it's not... 
see, it's still sort of cutting edge because ritual has been so depreciated in modernity. And it's mainly Jungians uh, now, in terms of depth psychology, who really are valuing ritual process and relating it to uh, relating it to things like Turner's work. I mean, like Murray Stein has done a good bit around this, and uh, uh, a lot of people have realized how much Turner is, is doves tales with uh, with Jungian psychology. It's a great tragedy for Jungians that Turner died so young because he had just come out as a Jungian uh, back in uh, back last uh, last fall. But anyway, so that will probably be growing because once you begin to be aware of of uh, this ritual process and the necessity for the heterogeneity of space and this sort of thing, then you begin to see how this stuff works and you begin things begin to make sense to you that previously didn't seem to be related and you begin to understand that human beings need this whether the mental health establishment knows it or not and just like children, they're going to get it wherever they can find it, you know? I mean, and if, they, and if it is not very good ritual leadership, it still beats the hell out of none. See, and that's the way human, human beings are. And one of the attractions uh, of so much uh, countercultural forms today is precisely because it is out of countercultural circles that you get a concern for these matters. And, of course, the problem with countercultural types is since they tend to kind of be in an ideological communitas, we're all just going to love each other. And we're just going to have this one big, uh, one big esalen on the globe, and we're all going to get into this global hot tub. <laughs> and all of these, you know, status distinctions and everything is going to pass away. The kingdom of God's going to come, and we're going to have the great dictatorship of the proletariat, you know. And everything just sort of fades into this. And of course, if you're in that thing and you don't realize this, if you don't realize that wherever you got human beings, you've got status and you've got communitas. And they, they will, there will never be a time when there isn't structure. And there will never be a time when there is not liminality. And uh, so the problem with so much of the stuff that springs up spontaneously around for this is that you don't have people that realize that structure always is, and people have to deal with it. And you've got to come out of the womb sometime and deal with the cold, hard world. And so it's going to be a task of our generation. I mean, we have got to... You've got to realize that there are people coming to you for ritual leadership. I don't care if you don't have any degree. You know, I don't, you know, care what kind of professional credentials you've got or lack thereof. There are people who, through the unconscious, sniff you out. And they, they, they come sniffing up to you and, 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 and they're unconscious, they feel it's just, does this person know how to dance or not? And uh, it may be that they've got a clergyman, analyst with three PhDs, four diplomas from various training institutes who doesn't know how to dance. I mean, so this thing is something that is uh, that is not going to be professionalized. I think one of the encouraging things you said or encouraging in mind is the reality just in their perspective. And what you just mentioned, there always is a need for structure. And the obverse, whatever structure, there's always a need somehow for human times to mm -hmm. see comes. So the dialectic goes back and forth, whatever the structure. Is. It is a dialectic. Always will be a dialectic. And it's a metabolism. It's a cultural metabolism. And uh, that's the problem with totalistic thinkers. See, when you get into communitas, you get into liminality, especially in liminality, you think totalistically. To the extent that you're in it, you tend to think totalistically. Notice somebody's depressed. You ever talk to a really depressed person? Or if you ever notice how you thought when you were really, I mean, not just a little depressed, I mean when you were really depressed. You talk about totalism. 
I mean, there isn't any getting in there. I mean, it doesn't matter how good you are at argument. You're talking to a depressed person, and there's no, it's sealed. It's hermetically sealed. The darkness is just sealed. And uh, so when you're in one of these states, you, you're in totalism. You need to be in totalism. But the person that's going to be the leader shouldn't be in it. The person who's the leader at least shouldn't be in your magic circle. I mean, they should be able to have one foot in and step in and step out. I mean, it's not that, the, that you as a ritual leader won't be in your own liminality sometimes, but it doesn't make sense to try to lead when you're leading the same space that you're in. We'll have a little bit more of a, uh, uh, of a opportunity to, to uh, uh, share together next week, and that's what I want us to do all next week. So I want you to, to bring in your reflections on your own experiences of these, of finding bound, of quest for boundaries. When was it that you started getting the urge to find a boundary? What was going on? And tell us what you can. You don't have to tell us everything. Uh, uh, I'd like for you to write it down if you can, if you have time. And you don't have to type it if you don't have a typewriter. But, uh, but I'd like to have a copy. And uh, uh, because I like, I like to collect these things. Because one of these days I'm going to write some more about it. And I want to be able to tell and say that uh, these are what people told me about their experience of this, about looking for the boundary when they've got disoriented and trying to find a place, trying to, you know. When I was 18, I went backpacking around the world. Uh, uh, you know, there are classic genres of this. And they used to, they used to do this in, in, in Europe a lot. In fact, the young man going off and hiking around Europe was one of the classic forms of this. Mm -hmm. Climbing a mountain. Uh, what kicked you off into your quest? Where did you find a boundary? Was it a boundary of marginality, social marginality, as in working with the poor? Was it, I mean, don't you think that's fascinating? I mean, I just think that's fascinating. You think about it. social marginality is functioning to the psyche as geographical marginality. But it does. It does. I'm talking to a conference, Seminary Consortium on Urban Pastoral Education tomorrow, about this stuff. It's a big urban congress, so Congress on Urban Ministry. And one of the things I want to talk to them about is how they've sacralized the poor. And the sacralization of the poor being one of the reasons why we don't help them to not be poor anymore. Because if you need them for sacred space, then you got to have them. The poor have always been uh, sacralized by the better, the more well-to-do. And this is a psychic reality here. And there is, if you read Eugen Buell's Craig thing on power and the helping professions, there's a psychic need to keep them poor so you can be a social worker and work with them. So you can be a missionary and a good Christian. See, I mean, there's a real shadow side to social programs. And uh, my little rap I'm going to give to these urban ministers tomorrow is not going to make me a popular man. <laughs> but I'm going to say you really need to understand the inner landscape of being involved in this stuff because if you don't, By the Reagan administration, which in a sense increases the poor. Yeah. The right. They, well, he's just and been. Doesn't go to that, huh? No, he's in a different myth. I mean, he, he is a, in a hero. He's in the heroic ego myth. You know, riding off into the sunset, you know, uh, six guns, uh, sort of the Gary Cooper myth. High noon is sacred space for him. <laughs> and uh, I'm serious, high noon, yeah, sacred right, space, right. you know, my God. I mean, you know, so what do you do? Well, you got a guy like Reagan who is very interested in sacred space, and what do you, where do you get it? Well, you get it in a standoff, a global 
a global shootout. And that is behind so many Armageddon fantasies. And of course, the clashing of the global cataclysm comes right in there because that's when all of the opposites come up and have to interact. But uh, so there are different myths that people act out, and uh, and you know, uh, you got to be around or, or or get a sense for the military mind to get a sense about the sacred war as sacred space. If you haven't seen Patton, <clears throat> get that for your VCR too, and look at that for seconds, because then you can get. Oh, and also Apocalypse Now. Oh yeah. Because Apocalypse Now, if you watch Apocalypse Now, you can get a real experiential feel for this, because there's a scene in there where they're playing Wagner, and they're coming in, and the choppers raiding this village, and it's Air Cav. And uh, who's that actor that's the air cow? Robert, Robert Duvall. I mean, there you see the goddess, the god Mars. I mean, you see the joy of what a sheer joy. Of that's a great one. Uh, Talking about napalms. Did you smell that, son? Smell victory. <laughs> it's Mars. And see, as long as people don't realize that war does create sacred space, and so they get out of their mind that sacred space is nice. Sacred space is not nice, but human beings are sacred space junkies, and we always will be. So the question is, are we going to provide people with opportunities for transformation that are minimally dangerous? Are we going to force the dark side of the self to set us up for experiences of sacred space that are going to be more interesting? You know, gonna, you know, it's like that, that uh, bumper sticker I saw. You know, a nuclear war can ruin your whole day. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> See, well, you know, <clears throat> the dark side of the self can, will pro propel human culture into ritual dances. That's what wars have always been about, in my judgment. You don't have some ritual form which allows this stuff to be dealt with more contained way. And of course, in primitive warfare, see, this is what we don't understand about contemporary warfare. In primitive warfare, it's much more like warfare, I mean, fighting between animals. Wolves, for example. There is much more containment of the destructiveness. There's much more code of honor. And if you, you know, you kill so many warriors, and then you go home to celebrate. I mean, you don't go in there and try to destroy the entire tribe. I mean, you count coup, and you, you get so many scouts, and then you uh, toast off to the uh, other, other leader of the band, and you go back to the tribe. But now, there has been so much, such a failure of the etiquette of war that survived up through pretty much into not completely through World War One, but you still had some of that etiquette of war in the in the officer corps, in the European officer corps. But uh, but with modern technology, it's just so exciting to use it. You know, you got that mustard gas, we got to use it. You know, and, uh, and and so we've got a situation now where we don't have the we don't have even the vestiges of the ritual inhibitors to acting this stuff out without any boundaries. So that makes, and that'll give you some thought tonight. You can think on that as you have your nightcap. <laughs> don't get me wrong. I don't like people staying poor. And I'm not against programs. I mean, I do what I can around on many levels to try work on social transformation. But I'm sick of people not understanding how serious the problem is. I'm sick of them not realizing how large the dragon is. Because, you know, people like to get into their nice little Marxist pietisms, you know, and they're going to get everything explained and so forth. They can't tell why things don't work. The only thing they can come up with uh, why we don't do a better job with this globe is because of Ronnie Reagan or something like that. Well, Ronnie Reagan never had enough power to be, to be the cause of what we see all around this carnage in this world. The carnage in this world is based right here in the psyche, in the splitting in the psyche, in our unconsciousness. And uh, these social transformation types 
of which I know and love many, uh, still are living a pre-Freudian pre fantasy that you can have global transformation without psyches being developed, but yet not going to have it without human beings getting far more sophisticated about the subtleties and the psyche because we go around projecting all these inner soul issues on people that we allegedly are supposed to help. And it's, well, just read you and Bill Craig, and you'll get my point. As long as you, if you are not in touch with the invalid inside of you, you've got to have invalids to work with so you can be the hero or heroine. I, I teach courses, you know, on, on the demonic, uh, evil dynamics, human dynamics of evil, and psychology and religion. And well, the thing that, well, at least is the kind of thing that I point out that, uh, that, uh, there is so much grounding. I mean, the, the only way you can understand the mess this world is in is if you understand the depths of this psychic uh, division. Because we are running around split and we uh, keep so much projection going on. Uh, that we have to have a split external world because if you have a split internal world you cannot stand a external world that's not split so you know the Jungian vision of moving toward individuation or wholeness is something that can only rise I mean uh, you can only allow the world to be whole, whole if you can allow yourself to be whole and the two processes have to come along together it's synchronistic you have to have a water that's rising that rises all the boats raises all the boats at the same time uh, but this is a very depressing thing to talk about because it makes it look a lot harder than if you just thought you had the right election this would happen or if you had everybody came on board with the right ideology or if everybody had the right degree it's really a spiritual psychological uh, psychosocial reality that we're dealing with and it's what St. Paul the Apostle was talking about when he talked about the principalities and the powers because the principalities and powers is just one way of talking about the sort of psychosocial enchantment that hovers around this globe and it's the enchantment that Jungians are always talking about the enchantment is when the self is I mean, the, the psyche is split into projection and it divided against itself and, uh, the significance of ritual is that is where the splitting is supposed to get some healing because it's in the sacred space that the split off elements traditionally have been allowed to come back but if you don't have any place where that can come back what do you do well you stay split other comments or questions? We have four minutes. Yeah, are you going to say something about the cards? Yes, thank you, thank you. Well, that's something that I want you to look around yourself to see too, because you will notice people, people, see there, we, we talked about the, the phenomenon of the regressive restoration of the persona, right? That's not chronic liminality, see. That's sort of a, sort of a, a crazy form of being a structure. Give me some examples of people who are chronically liminal. That is, they got into sacred geography and can't get out. Now, who are some examples of that? Well, then he mentioned something like, what, what's he called, Dharma Bums? Dharma Bums, back in the 50s, Jack Kerouac's crew. Yeah. Who else would be examples of that? <laughs> That's right. Their whole life is conferences. Or their whole life exists in, in uh, uh, human potential groups. They don't really have any life between the group sessions. But they get burned out after a while. They get they, they get to realizing something's funny with it. You talk to people like that one. People that are substance of, hmm? yeah substance abuse, chronic substance. Timothy Leary, as opposed to Ron Dyer, uh, one sort of getting into the fluctuating 
Right. I would put uh, in this context somebody that's into promiscuous sexuality and stays in it for more than a period of uh, a year or two. Um, and that whether it's homosexual sexuality or heterosexual sexuality, somebody who is in the promiscuous sexuality with a lot of sexual partners over a period of time much longer than a year, maybe two. But you see, the time we're talking about here is the same time required for a grief process and a healthy person to finish. A grief process can finish in six months, or it can finish in two years. But if you get going much beyond two years, you've got chronic liminality. And this chronic liminality is unresolved. We talk about pastoral care training all the time. We used to talk about chronic, you know, you know, unresolved grief reaction. Well, that's just chronic liminality. It's somebody that, that had a death and they never let the person die. And this is the parent that's got, they had a child die, and they've got the room just like it was when the child died. Or this is the widow who has the house exactly like it was when the husband died five years later. This is the this is the person who is divorced who has not gotten rid of the ritually disposed of the the oblic the objects, the sacred objects of the marriage. And there and wonders why they can't find another relationship. See? They're still wearing they're still wearing the engagement ring given to them by their former spouse. Or still wear still have all of the paraphernalia. And uh, this is a thing that not very many people are aware of, but uh, but there are many people who have not been able to get started on another relationship that if a friend or therapist points out to them, of course you can't. You haven't let this one die. And if you begin to look around, you will notice all of the ways in which the chronic liminality is sustained. Now, yeah? Is there a difference between chronic liminality and, I guess I'd call it perpetual liminality? Because there are some states like the shaman who is always on hand. Always well, that's you see, you got to be real careful about that because there are people that think that the shamans and crazy people are the same thing, but that's not true. A shaman is an initiate. A crazy person is a failed initiate. Uh, a religious leader is not in chronic liminality, and a shaman is not in chronic liminality. A shaman can walk in both worlds. A ritual elder can walk in both worlds, but to the extent that a shaman was really in a liminal state, he would not be able to function as a shaman. Because if you're in a liminal state, you do not, you are not able to function as a ritual elder for somebody. You may act like you think. I mean, you know, there are a lot of crazy people in mental hospitals that think they're global religious leaders, but now. If you study shamanism carefully, it's not to say they're not in touch with, with liminality. They've got one foot in each place. They used to say of the great rabbi, Ben Yohai, he was a great tree that stood in both worlds. And that's the case with a ritual elder. And, uh, and is not lost in it. If you're really in a liminal state, you really are disoriented. No such thing as being oriented in a rich and liminal state. That's the good news to you folks there in liminality. You know, I mean, if you're worried about yourself being disoriented, just welcome to liminality. You know, I mean, that's just enjoy the swim as long as you can. <coughs> Other comments? Well, we're over. Well, this has been fun. Look, next week we're going to depend on your thinking and reflecting, and we'll share together as much as we can. Uh, we'll take we'll take the entire time to try to get as much data, so much empirical, phenomenological report on the ways in which you have experienced yourself and the ways you have noticed other people uh, in this quest for the boundary 
for a liminoid experiencing or a liminal experiencing. My, rap, my final rap is that uh, it's clear, it should be clear to you that I think that, that liminality is clearly available in modernity and contemporary times. It is not easy to find it. And, uh, <laughs> that's the final session. <laughs> We're going to be bringing this together in, a, in, in the context of psychotherapy, contemporary psychotherapy, uh, in general first, <clears throat> and then especially in, in the context of depth psychology and psychoanalysis in general, and then in Jungian analysis in particular. And I will be uh, talking some about uh, why I really do believe that uh, Jungian Analysis is one of the uh, preeminent places today, uh, at least in our culture, where uh, truly liminal uh, experience can be had, though certainly, as I've said before, not the, by far not the only place. And let me just review just briefly now what we have, what we've done. We started out looking at traditional views on what we call the heterogeneity of space in human experience. We looked at Iliadi and his concept, his understanding of what it takes to have truly regenerative space and for uh, real renewal and rebirth and initiation to happen. And as you remember, Iliadi was very clear about the relationship between the heterogeneity of space in human experience and the capacity for any kind of rebirth and renewal to occur. But he took the standpoint that that could not be something that modern, contemporary, indu industrial society uh, persons could uh, experience. It, that in his view, the only thing that we can experience are vestiges of that kind of space. As he put it, in the place where you first fell in love, or uh, some dear place uh, of your childhood, some very special places which are not, which clearly then for you, the very existence of those things mean that, that space is not homogenous, totally because there are places that carry up what we would call energy load or, or some libidinal load for you. <clears throat> and then we turned to Turner, and we looked at the way in which Turner built upon the work of Ili Iliadi, and especially uh, Arnold Van Gannup, and Van Gannup's work on the rites of passages. And we looked at the way in which in many ways, Turner agreed with Iliadi about the reality of the heterogeneity of space and human experience and the necessity of that for, for human culture and personality. Uh, and, and we saw Turner's movement beyond Iliadi in saying that contemporary persons do experience the heterogeneity of space more clearly than Iliadi thought. And uh, that, that space, however, is divided now in such a way that you have two forms, liminoid space, which is the space he believes characteristic of contemporary life, the sacred space characteristic of contemporary life, which is a fragmented liminality, a partial, in other words, liminality. And we went into the ways in which liminoid space and liminal space are different. And then we pointed out that Turner, like Iliadi, really didn't, does not believe that, that truly liminal space uh, is something which is in uh, contemporary industrial society. And then I presented my own view on that. 
was saying that I believe that uh, Turner was incorrect in his understanding of liminality and what constitutes it. He had believed that the way you tell is whether a ritual process is society-wide or not, as it couldn't be in a tribal society. And since a tribal society could have a, 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 a society-wide process, then it could be truly liminal. And that since uh, modern society is so much more complex and uh, divided in its organization, that uh, now that's why you couldn't have this. My argument with Turner has been uh, on this, that uh, he put too much emphasis on the nature of the society in question and not enough emphasis on the, the availability of ritual leadership. And I emphasize much more than either Iliadi or Turner did the importance of the creation of the boundary, the thresholds for sacred space, and the stewardship of that boundary by a ritual elder of some form. Because if that boundary is not, and you can think of it in the context of a a uh, magic circle or a sanctuary or the, the uh, precincts of a temple. But if that space is not clearly delimited and if there's not someone who, who stewards that boundary and makes sure that boundary is kept uh, inviolate, and if there's not someone who knows when you need to enter and when you need to leave and what you're doing in there anyway, what the purpose of your being there anyway, then, uh, then it is unlikely that transformation processes uh, will proceed uh, without some difficulty. And we talked previously about one of the main problems is that if you don't have a what we Jungians call a tight vessel, a, uh, a sealed alchemical vase, then we put it this way, it doesn't heat up enough. And if it doesn't heat up enough, then uh, there's not sufficient intensity. And if there's not sufficient intensity, then the change, while well, there will be change, <clears throat> and we'll be getting into that much more in a minute, there will be change. But uh, the change may be uh, much more limited and uh, uh, indeed, there may be some uh, some uh, very serious uh, missteps in the process. Uh, another thing I pointed out, and I want to reiterate again tonight in this context, is that sacred space cannot be controlled, even by the most expert ritual elder there is. Many scholars have misunderstood ritual process because they have observed that in traditional cultures, ritual elders observe their ritual procedures with extremely, uh, what we would almost call pedantic care. Uh, you can study uh, the ritual processes in Hinduism or various tribal rites and so forth, and, 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 and we moderns are amazed at the care that the ritual elders put into doing it just right. As Iliadi would put it, uh, doing it just like it was done uh, in the primeval time, in the archaic times of gods. Scholars have often misunderstood the implications of that and have assumed that the masters, the, the ritual elders, uh, really thought they had control of the ritual and had control of sacred space. My sense of that is, and what I've been trying to, to say to persons about uh, these processes and sacred space is, that it was precisely because the ritual elders knew how fragile sacred space, transformative space was, that they observed it, these things so carefully. But they had no illusions about their capacity to control it. Uh, and in effect, what we would say today is they knew a lot of things you could do to ruin it. And they knew a lot of things you could do to invoke it. 
but they would never, uh, in all my studies, I have never, I have never really seen any empirical justification in the in the studies, uh, in the studies of others, to to show me that these people were arrogant about the uh, nature of the transformative space because I don't see any of that at all. I, I, I sense a, a deep humility and uh, uh, fear that they will ruin it. And, uh, and so that's something I want you to keep in mind very carefully when we, when we start looking at uh, what we have here on the board a little later. Uh, now, uh, let me say just a little bit about <clears throat> uh, transformation processes uh, in the Jungian view um, in terms of what we call energetics, or that is theory of psychic energy, the patterning of psychic energy. See, there are people who uh, quite rightly argue that the individuation process goes on naturally. And, you know, you get the kind of a division among Jungians. Uh, some Jungians think uh, that large numbers of people individuate and uh, go through their life cycle without ever hearing the word Jungian analyst or Jungian analysis. Others who are so aware of the human psyche's tendency to split and, uh, and for needed transformations not to occur, uh, put less emphasis on all this, uh, what we might call ritual-less individuation. Uh, truth is probably somewhere in between. And I want to just comment a little bit about, about why this business is so subtle. Because in the Jungian view, quite rightly, uh, the psyche is developing. It is a natural process. It is what we would call a biosocial process. And there's a metabolism going on. And um, uh, in, the, in the Jungian view of the psyche, there are always energy flows going on. And what happens, we might say, when one gets to a point where an initiation is needed, that is to say some new life task is confronted, uh, the, the libido in that individual may be able to confront that and may be able to engage it and may be able to move on through that process given certain developmental prerequisites in their past life. They may be able to do that. But one thing that we also know is that human beings have always realized that some transitions are harder than others. And they know that a lot of the time when, when, when the very difficult transitions are encountered, whether they're life cycle related or catastrophe related or something like that, uh, that you need some supports to the individual psyche in recanalizing the energy. In other words, reshaping the energy flow in the psyche. And I want to recommend to you Anthony Stevens' book, uh, Archetypes, A Natural History of the Self, uh, for a, an excellent reflection on the uh, biological basis for uh, understanding the kind of ritual processes we're talking about. That is the book that Victor Turner, incidentally, was using in, in uh, responding to um, these kinds of issues in the Zygon article, uh, Brain, Body, and Culture. But anyway, so... Uh, Certain individuals may need less pronounced, less obvious ritualization 
And I think some of our colleagues would say they just don't engage in ritualization much. I do not agree with that. My assumption is that anywhere you have individuation occurring, you have ritualization occurring, period. I don't think it could very easily be argued uh, that one can go through an individuation process without ritualization of some form, in some location, in some way. It may never be called ritual. It may not have anything to do with any professional person, but there is some ritualization occurring. And I would refer you to Eric Erickson's work on ritualization uh, uh, for a little context in that. Also, the recent psychoanalytic literature <clears throat> Uh, such as that of D.W. Winnicott on uh, the importance of the holding environment for personality development and so forth. <clears throat> so anyway, uh, my own view is that, uh, that the two things always occur together in some, in some way. And that if somebody uh, suggests that a person is just initiated by the self. Well, we Jungians can say, certainly, all initiation is done by the self. That's right. But my response would be, show me a self that isn't grounded in a social process. I haven't seen one yet. And so, and so our deep intrapsychic perspective that we operate out of needs to be contexted by a sense for systems and the, the social world in which that individual is individuating and ritual process enables us to think about that. Now let us turn to the two papers I suggested that you uh, read for tonight. And I'll just highlight some of the points there. And uh, break in and interrupt me at any time as I talk about this for clarification. We will take a break at 8. and. Uh, and then we'll come back and discuss all this stuff. <clears throat> How many of you got to read my little article on uh, ritual, psychotherapy's ritual process? Many of you, okay. Uh, in that article, I was highlighting uh, these three characteristics that I think you find in all therapies. Uh, the, the therapist may not know they're there, but that doesn't mean they're not there. Uh, and I invite you to think with me just a few minutes as we, as we talk about submission, containment, and enactment in the therapies. Uh, in that paper, I talked about um, uh, group therapies of various forms as an obvious uh, kind of illustration of these, uh, these uh, principles. And I mean uh, group therapies ranging as wide as family therapy, psychodrama, uh, group psychosynthesis, uh, practices, uh, gestalt group practices, what we used to know in the old days as encounter groups, uh, even more traditional group therapy, in which it's more rule-laden and uh, more, uh, uh, shall we say, conventional. But in each one of these, the submission is clear. You don't become a member of a group therapy group unless you submit to its rules. There is a voluntary submission. And you know, much has been made among psychotherapists out of a professional model of psychotherapy about contracts, 
a therapeutic contract that you have with a person to do therapy with them. And there's been much emphasis on this as a sort of a professional idea. We're going to protect the public from unscrupulous practitioners, which is, of course, important. And we're also going to protect the therapist from unreasonable demands on the part of people that would be involved in the therapy. No one, as far as I know, has ever talked about the contract, the contract in ritual terms. Uh, because it's quite clear to me that the, the contract, the therapeutic contract in group therapy and as all other forms of therapy, uh, is one of the chief means by which not only uh, submission to a process is attained, but also through which a container is formed. Uh, and I, I suggest to you that uh, this idea of submitting to a process is very key, the idea of submitting to a process. You know, people are really, you know, get a bee in their bonnet these days and talk to them about submission. Submission is not a popular value today. Ever since the Enlightenment, when autonomy became so central as a cultural value, uh, submission has gotten a bad name. It's quite clear to me, however, that, that uh, there is a submission to process. You can see the parallel in going on a pilgrimage. When a person goes on a religious pilgrimage, uh, they can relax their ego control somewhat and give themselves over to the structure of the pilgrimage. And if they just flow along with the pilgrimage, it organizes their lives for them. They're supposed to be here one day, there the next do this ritual the next, and so forth. And uh, a uh, therapeutic process has its own structure. And you can really see that in a group process. If you've ever been, how many of you have ever been in group therapy? If you've ever been in group therapy or any kind of groups that approximate it, you'll notice that there's a, a, a lot of ritual behavior involved. You do the same thing every week. And, uh, and, uh, and it's, uh, uh, you know, people that have studied sociology, uh, you know, Goffman and things like that pick up on it, but they still don't really think about it as ritual process very clearly. Uh, but anyway, so there's a submission to the contract. And in most of these therapies, there is a submission to um, the therapist in some way. Now, a lot of therapists are really antsy about admitting that. They want to present themselves, oh, we are the advocates of autonomy, blah, blah, blah. But the fact is, when you go into therapy, it is an act of submission that is very substantial and uh, dangerous. I mean, just as going into any liminal state any time in history, including today, is dangerous, going into therapy is dangerous. Uh, look at the statistics of, uh, uh, with regard to uh, uh, abuse of client confidence uh, and trust that you see in studies with the APA and uh, so forth. Um, and uh, so it's a risky business going into therapy because, you know, if you didn't submit to something wouldn't be so dangerous. But you are submitting when you go into a group. And there were a lot of casualties of the group encounter movement back in the 60s and early 70s that would be happy to testify about the dangers of getting into groups, submitting to group process. Okay. It's not such a difficult concept to think about, though, as we spoke of it before with 
the axis, the, the inflation and alienation axis, mm -hmm. and that if someone is submitting for therapy, they're also may or not be experiencing at some point the end of the axis of alienation. Therefore, the opposite may perhaps sometimes inflation. So submission from that point. Well, see, yeah, and that, but that's one of the things a person has to deal with in, in going into therapy, because uh, one always risks in going into therapy people finding out stuff about them uh, they don't want to know, don't want to know, and it worse than that, finding out things about yourself that you don't know that uh, that is going to be experienced as humiliating. And um, I'm thinking even yeah. from the standpoint of the therapist who is may or may not be experiencing a person submitting to the, a space, right. a spatial relationship, right. not just like the person. Right, yeah. right, right. Now, uh, my sense is that, uh, that, there, that the space and the person cannot be separated, that they can only be separated in the mind of a nice, naive therapist that really thinks that they don't carry incredible power as a therapist. Uh, there are not too many of those. Uh, people know, because most, you know, and certainly analysts know because they've all had to be in analysis. And they know how much power is given, freely given to this healer. And, uh, and yet, uh, that's frightening. And um, I think people's unwillingness to admit some, and there are people that are unwilling to admit that, I think that is uh, uh, usually a shadowy thing. I think, I think that the, uh, well, you look at Eugen Buell Craig's books on power in the helping professions. If you're not conscious about the power that you have in your helping role, it will simply be unconscious, and and uh, you can abuse it easier. See, without having to feel guilty about abusing it. See? You were going to say. Yeah. That he said things to each other when he was in Allah. Right. Uh, that's uh, I'm often shocked, especially in the Freudian analysis, he kind of ruthless in a way, which things are made that are not in the And uh, I think he feels like that is what they do in the future. Well, uh, I think that that you're right. A lot of things uh, are confronted that are not manageable, and I think that uh, that's true in many different therapies. Because one of the fantasies human beings have is that life is manageable, and uh, that one of the first things that needs to go. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, because that is an inflation. Uh, I mean, one can cope the best one can, but one should never get into the fantasy that life is manageable because it simply is not. And, um, uh, but anyway, it's not just Freudians. I mean, people uh, in various schools, people in process of therapy encounter things that are just very different. They're not, they vary. Therapies vary on the, the, the style of confrontation. Some therapies are very confrontive, getting people to face things that they uh, are not wanting to face. Others uh, are much more gentle and receptive in their modes, but still people have to confront things they don't want to face. I mean, uh, I, I, uh, Jungians are normally very... Uh, very uh, receptive and not and don't push people 
further or faster than I feel I need to go. They don't like rushing people. But still, my experience of Jungian analysis is that uh, you get confronted a lot with a psyche. Uh, but, uh, but the submission business uh, is, is it's always submission to a process, and that thing is most obvious. And it's also submission to a leader in some way. It's also submission to a sort of dethronement. For example, if you're in group therapy, you have to submit to a certain kind of communitas, a certain kind of uh, equality with the other people in the group. You think about uh, uh, AA groups, which you can really look at as ritual process in a deep way. And uh, you got to say, I'm an alcoholic. You can't go in there and play uh, big standard oil executive, even if you are one. You have to submit to a ritual humiliation. And that ritual humiliation is not without its purpose. Uh, and it's not just, a, it's not a sadistic purpose. It's to deal with, uh, fairly directly, with inflation. Uh, but anyway, let's just talk a little bit about containment. We're going to be talking about containment a lot tonight. And, uh, and that, that is something that... Uh, uh, you can see clearly here. It is the containment which makes possible the uh, facing of the split-off truth. Now, this is this is true in all the therapies. The ones that you would have the hardest case making, the hardest time making a case for, would be behavioral therapies. But I would argue, just show me a behavioral therapist and let me watch him a while, and I'll show you how it's ritual process, even with a behavior mod therapist. Uh, but, but you get this special kind of space, and things can be said and felt there that will not be said or felt anywhere else. We talk about the repressed returning. Uh, in traditional times, we talk about the gods speaking, sacred instruction, uh, suffering, acceptance of suffering. You can say that it is in that, that is that container that makes possible the individual suffering that which he or she has always needed to suffer, but simply could not get the courage up to suffer. Jung makes it very clear that a neurosis results when someone is unwilling to suffer that which life uh, requires them to suffer. And uh, so what the container does is to give you a place where you feel, let's put it in Winnicott's terms, you feel sufficiently held so that you can let yourself suffer what it is that is timely and appropriate for you to suffer or what you've tried to postpone. But without the containment, as we would put it, you couldn't stand it. I mean, human beings can stand a lot, but what they can't stand is this kind of suffering that is required at certain critical points in life without a environment which holds them like a mother holds a child in some way. And so the container is, is uh, in some ways a, uh, a mother. It is a womb. And, uh, in fact, I would argue that the, the prototype or archetype for 
effective ritual leadership is a mother, a good enough mother, as Winnicott says, with her infant. A good enough mother with her infant. And what Winnicott means by that is that it is a person who is attuned to the organism of the other person and doesn't intrude where intrusion is not desired and yet does not absent when absence is not desired. And where the, uh, where the uh, child is not protected from the necessary suffering that the child must do at various stages, the necessary struggles, the Freudians call that optimal frustration. You must have optimal frustration for growth to occur. And the good enough mother allows optimal frustration. The pampering mother does not. And hence, the child is not initiated at the early, through the things a child, early childhood needs to be initiated into. But anyway, so that is sort of an image for that containing environment, that holding environment, uh, which is what the containment is. Any questions about that for you all? Yes, ma'am. Is there any way of uh, doing that for yourself? Maybe in a warm light? Not in my judgment. I may be wrong, but I don't think so. Because you can't be inside the pressure cooker and outside it at the same time. And, you know, you might turn it on turn the stove on, get somebody else to put you in. I don't know how you get into a pressure cooker and turn the stove on and then turn it off before it blows up, you know. And, uh, and that, well, I'm really serious because now it doesn't mean, remember, it doesn't mean that you can't go through individuation, you know, some sense, some cases, uh, without, you know, having cooked at 450 degrees for, for some people can some people apparently and I suspect personally that it's got to do with their early childhood experience I expect that the better your early childhood experiences were in terms of what we call object relations I suspect that the easier it is for your libido to shift at appropriate places in the rest of your life uh, without massive intervention. I suspect that. I'm not sure that's just my idea about that. But if you're like me, and uh, you had a little problem with your early object relations, then it's harder to get that libido shift without the temperature being high. And a little higher pressure at certain pressure points. And so, uh, I guess I would say that what is not going to happen is you can't heat it up very hot by yourself. And if you're a person that needs it to be hot to cook and change, then that won't help you. If you're a person that's really, really well put together and you had this great mother and father and home and optimal frustration and your mother was good enough and all these things and you made it through those rapprochement subphases and all that stuff before you were five and all that sort of thing that you might not need it to be turned up so high and that ordinary interactions might help you get through these things uh, increasingly I doubt that but I always say that <laughs> just, to, just to just to you know I don't see too many people I see a lot more people who are aborted and uncooked and unfinished and so forth, and I see that got through it without a container. Yeah, you would say something wrong. No. No, I don't. I, I, I really do not. No, no, I don't think marriage can do it at all. I think that's why marriage you know, it's such a disaster area these days. People are expecting that from their marriages. See what I mean? 
I mean, they're looking to the spouse for transformation. Why is my life not better? Well, obviously, it's you. <laughs> See? If you ever see one of those, let me know. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, again, we got to separate this out real carefully. You can individuate without a vessel that's got tight containment and high pressure and heat. Some people can. Marriage is certainly a context for individuation process. And nobody would deny that. You know, or failed initiation and uh, individuation processes more often than not. But I honestly haven't seen many people who are that mature who can hold a spouse in that in that way, in the way that Winnicott's talking about holding. Because we expect to get our needs met from that spouse. And see, one of the key things about parenting, I mean, you see in this Winnicottian stuff, which incidentally is very similar to Jungian thought in many ways, is that Right, if things are going well between baby and mother, mother is getting a lot of needs met at one level. Instinctual needs met. But there is another sense in which the role of a parent is to pay attention to the needs of the child until they get 35 years old and finally get out of graduate school. And, you know, I talk a lot about this to a lot of people, a lot of places, and and, uh, and without retaliating out of, out of the uh, out of the needs of the uh, the frustrated needs of the parent, the, the narcissistic needs of the parent. And I just really, I mean, I I would like to think that one of these days when we all get more mature and the kingdom comes, and whatever, eschaton that there'll be a lot of those kinds of marriages, but uh, I think that's real dangerous to expect a spouse to be your holding environment in, the, in this sense. Uh, fellow traveler, yes, but uh, I think that, and, and you come to think of it, that is what people are looking for a lot in their marriage. That's why they project their mother complex on each other. Mother and father complexes on the spouse. You see? I mean, which is so typical. You don't let the person be who they are. you got to turn them into a parent. Well, but what are they looking for in that? Well, they're looking for somebody to initiate them. Help them grow up. That's what you look to parents for. So... Uh, it's undoubtedly the need for it's undoubtedly present, but uh, it doesn't work out too well most of the time. Okay, what about enactment? Well, enactment is just a word that's used uh, uh, to talk about uh, what I call practicing. You know, you can try on new images, self images, and other images, and world images without having to take all the consequences for them, uh, as you would in structure, in Turner's idea of structure. In, in liminality, you can try on all sorts of things in a playful mode, more playful. It may not feel playful to you when you're doing it, but you can try these things on. You have loosened, you have loosened up the surface of all your ego, you know. And you've begun to sit a little looser to all these things that you thought about yourself. You know, you you really thought you were X, but you realize Y. That may not be true at all. So you sit a little looser, and then you try on other possible personas. You try on other possible self-images and images of parents and images of women and men. And 
images of sex and images of world and so forth, but you don't have to commit to them in any kind of way which is oppressed on you by external authority. It has to feel right. And so enactment, it, I, I used to refer to all those ways which the various therapies let a person enact. Now, the clearest thing is psychodrama. You really want to see this in a big way. If you haven't ever been involved in psychodrama, I recommend that you get it. It is a trip. I mean, in family sculpting, you ever sculpt your family system? I mean, that's a trip. And uh, it is extremely rev revelatory to you, you know, when you do it. And then you can rearrange it and, and uh, play with how it might have been if uh, you and your ex-parent were not so triangulated in that way. How what it might your life have been like if if it had been different? Yeah. Oh, there are uh, there are uh, people all over the cities. I think that do it. Uh, I know that they. There's a psychodrama association, and uh, a guy by the name of Marino was the big famous psychodramatist. Uh, but uh, they do a lot of it in family therapy, and they do. I know the Adlerians do a lot of it, and, um, and uh, psychosynthesis has a lot of psychodrama techniques. They don't call it that. That's what it is. Uh, and that's where it's most obvious, but if you look at practically any kind of therapy, look at behavioral therapy, there are enactments. You practice things. I don't know I mentioned this to you before, but some guy was working with a, a, a Chicago therapist, and he was shy and easily embarrassed, and they gave him a basketball and had him dribble the basketball all over the loop during, during the day. And, uh, that, of course, that's, we all know, that's systematic desensitization, right? It's also an enactment. It's also a ritual humiliation. It also worked. <laughs> One near shy after that. <laughs> but, uh, but there's always this enactment quality. There's always this enactment quality of something that you try on new ways of looking at yourself, new ways of acting. You don't have to get married to them. Um, we, we sometimes we talk about strengthening the ego. You know, use whatever technical jargon that our particular therapeutic system uses, but it means experimenting with new behaviors and new... Uh, ways of thinking and new ways of imaging and what it what you got there is you've got the container serving as a stand-in for your ego structure because you have been stripped of the solid fielding uh, the, the solid feeling ego structure your ego doesn't feel very solid you can't stand on it you know, it's, uh, I often think of the uh, image of St. Peter trying to walk on the water. That is a good image for being in a liminal state. You've got to be in the boat. You've got to be in the container. Unless you're somebody that's a master of both worlds. And, uh, and uh, Peter was like you and me uh, when we're in a liminal state. He didn't have his old ego, pre-conversion, you know, pre-following Christ. He didn't have that old fisherman ego to sustain him. And so when you get out on that water, which is a wonderful image, stormy water, which is a wonderful image for liminality, you need that container, that boat. That's why you, that's why you got it, got to have it. That's the uh, ark, Noah's ark, that's what that's about. All these images 
about uh, being in some vessel during the during the journey, or about that. Uh, so that provides that 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 way for you to be held when your ego structure has been we call it destructured, purposefully destructured, and uh, so you've got the submission of the process without which, look at it this way, no submit, no destruction. It mean the same thing. No submit, no destructure. No container. Chaos when you destructure. Or I should say terror. Bad enough when you got the container. You know, somebody's hand to hold on to. But if you don't have the container, it's dissociation, drowning. And then in that the enactment which is necessary to what we might say grow a new ego adaptation like a new snake skin the old one doesn't work you had to shed it either you got up the courage to submit and shed it or you got kicked into submitting by life and shed it if you got kicked into submitting like you had a psychotic break, or you had a mental breakdown, or they nervous breakdown, or they had to hospitalize you, it, you feel worse about it, but it's all the same. Uh, so anyway, those three things you can see. Uh, I haven't seen any therapies that don't that don't have those. Uh, most therapists, you tell them they're ritual leaders, taking it that as an insult. Uh, because of the tendency, the, you know, the Freudian, the old time classical Freudian negativism about ritual, which is changing a lot now. Now, let's look at this other article, uh, the Goodhart article on uh, fear of analytical interaction. And that article is really about containment. Uh, it is 8 o'clock. Let's take a five-minute break. Come back. I just want to move through these, uh, this second, uh, the points in the second paper quickly. Um, William Goodhart is a San Francisco a Jungian analyst of uh, some repute. In this article, he discusses the important work of the Freudian analyst Robert Lang. And uh, Lang has put a great deal of emphasis on the importance of the frame, what he calls the frame in analysis, which is simply another word for the boundary uh, uh, and the constitution of the container we talked about. I mean, put, they put a lot of emphasis on sessions remaining at the same time, uh, regularity of payment, uh, and a number other of other things which, which are used to talk about keeping the frame. And... Uh, uh, great deal of emphasis put on regularity. Uh, and uh, uh, it's so obvious if you look at this thing from a point of view like Victor Turner's or from the point of view of ritual process that this is a, this is a concern of Lang's for the issue of what is appropriate containment or what we've said earlier about how do you form a boundary and keep it secure. Langs argues, and Goodhart's talking about Langs in this article. Good, uh, Langs argues that if you don't keep the frame, uh, you either get uh, faulty healing processes or no, or none. You know. And so uh, there's also an assumption that if you're not keeping the boundary in the therapy, for example, if uh, 
if you're working with someone and uh, they ask to change their time because such and such happened. And if you do that without dealing with the desire to change the time, according to Lang's, uh, you may be asking, you may be telling the person unconsciously, I cannot contain you, that the unconscious message the person may get is that if I let my, if the message is this, if you let your chaos out, I won't be able to take it and it will spill all over everywhere, maybe even destroy me. Now, there are many of us in the Jungian community that appreciate Langs very much, but think he's too literalistic about how one keeps a boundary. It's been my experience that a, a therapist can break almost all of Lang's rules and still be capable of very adequate containment of a person. In other words, this needs to be studied much more. <coughs> the whole issue of containment needs to be studied very carefully, very closely in therapy to see the various ways different kinds of therapists do contain. Uh, but the point is well taken. I mean, you don't have to be a literalist, fundamental, what I call a fundamentalist language to understand his point. That is to say, if you feel like you've got a lot of chaos in you, and it terrifies you, all these feelings, positive and negative, that scare you to death, and that you've split off, you have to be sure that that person you're working with can't handle it, can't stand it, and won't run or in some other way uh, allow your self, your psyche to be spilling all over the place. And so that is, um, that is the concern that, uh, that Goodhart points out. And he talks about how Jungian this kind of point of view is. And, he, and, and they, they come up with these three different kinds of interpersonal fields that can exist at any time in therapy. And one thing that's, that's, that's helpful to realize is that no therapist or analyst can ever create the, the most healing space on demand. It's not in a therapist or analyst control. An analyst, by virtue of who he or she is or what they do can ruin it. You can guarantee it don't, that it will not exist by behaving in certain ways. But you cannot make, the, this is the best, secured symbolizing field. And I'll go through the persona restoring field is when you and your analyst are engaging in uh, something that makes you both feel good. Talk about something good and feel good. Therapeutic relationship has got some of that. That's not getting down to business. That's what I call a sort of minuet. <laughs> you know, we're doing this until we get used to being here together in this crazy time. And then the second kind of field, which is which you often, you, you, almost in every therapeutic relationship, you'll have some of this complex discharging field. Now, this would be, for example, if I'm seeing a young man, and he is a god-awful poor, you know, so immature that uh, it's just incredible. And... Uh, I project my poor air shadow onto him, see. Isn't I'm the therapist. I project my own poor air stuff onto him, my own unresolved, uh, immature young man. I project onto him. Any issues I have not dealt with about that. 
And then he constellates in me my own negative father complex. And I constellate in him his negative father. So he's projecting his negative father onto me, and because I've got a negative father complex, I respond. I know that. So I know that dance. So I get into being the negative father, and I don't know it. And so when he is being his little immature, poor self, I find myself feeling what? Impatient with him. Wanting to strangle him. Wanting to wring his neck, kick him in the rear, and get the hell out of here. You know, you're wasting my time, kid. I don't say it. I feel it. Well, what we got going here is a complex discharging field. He's not going to get any better while that's going on. I'm still earning my money because it isn't pleasant. <laughs> but, uh, but he's not going to get any better because that's always what he's gotten from older men. Every time he gets with an older man, the older man doesn't understand what's going on. So he says, let's ritualize, older man. You be the bad daddy and I'll be the rebellious son. See if we can get this one going. And the amazing thing is they can get it going with everybody. You just watch. They just get that going. But no, nothing ever changes, right? I mean, it's always the same. Four fired from 14 jobs, you know, because they got into this with their boss, you know. Well, the change occurs when you get the secured boundary. And the elder is at least, you know, you got to think about the good enough mother as an image here. Not a great analyst, just a good enough analyst. Or a good enough therapist, not a great one. Good enough one. One that can know when they can catch themselves after the session. They say, oh, well, they found it. Really had me into it. I got to be aware of that next time. Oh, my goodness, one thing right. You know, that's pretty good. <laughs> uh, you know. well, Fantasy is about being perfect. Therapists go down the more you work. But anyway, uh, so but 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 the capacity to increasingly get more sense for what we call countertransference to be able to pick up when this kind of thing is happening, be able to get conscious of it, be able to uh, intervene in it, uh, you know, hopefully. And if and of course the the therapy and, and this is problem with a lot of therapies. A lot of therapies do not need their therapist. First of all, they don't require them to be, to be analyzed, so they don't know their own stuff very well. Number two, uh, there's not enough emphasis on countertransference and transference, and therefore you're not taught in many therapies to be aware when you are becoming the other end of the dance in a non-healing way. Well, hey, I'm asking is, uh, is my good body here? Good heart. Good heart. <laughs> <laughs> good, good night, good body. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the uh, the way that you see the body and the way that you in terms of there are these really positive things that can happen during That's about that. In the sense that, I mean, for example, there, you do need your, uh, your uh, positive father complex to come into play and work. You know, there's, there's, some com there's some complex discharging that can be healing. You're right about that. But what I'm really referring to is sort of the unconscious kind of... Uh, of uh, uh, 
destructive counter-transference, transference, transference uh, dyads that you get into that people like Fordham have written about, and, uh, uh, which is so common and is extremely difficult to deal with, I mean, even at best. Uh, but uh, but uh, it's by no means always bad. But the, the thing that both Langs and Goodhart emphasize so much is that if you don't get to this secured symbolizing phase, you won't get any deep transformation. You get a rearrangement of things. And, and uh, uh, the secured symbolizing phase is when there is enough of a sense of being held and contained and a sort of playful mode has arisen in which the unconscious can really kind of flow, gets into a flow, and a person can begin to experience their feelings and their images and their fantasies, and uh, it is uh, very different from the process that exists most of the time. Now, if you've been in therapy or analysis, you will notice that there are some times when you just flow and more will happen for you in one session than happened in 25 previous ones. And you know it's not because the analyst did anything himself or herself or that you did any Turner's communitas. It just, the conditions are right and it comes, the spirit comes. And that's where a deep healing occurs. This is the kind of process that Jungians have, have talked about, is the context for the Mysterium Conjunctionis. This is where you get that deep uh, soul relating that, uh, that Jung talks about uh, in alchemical terms, the sacred marriage. Is there? Yeah. Added that uh, sort of the word secured seems like, and so it's symbolized. But secured seems to have also that it's a, a participation, the part of participatory right. that the uh, one who is helping to secure the space is also maybe active, not uh, just passive, right. hearing the uh, conscience, right. maybe participate in it. The reason I ask or, or try to ask questions on security is how would that reconcile perhaps Optimal yeah. frustration. Yeah. You may not even get into that. Yeah, well, this is different. Yeah, secured here really refers to that boundary. It's the boundary that's secured. And uh, the assumption is that if the boundary is not secured, however you go about securing the boundary in your therapy, I mean, whether you're a Freudian and got all these cleanliness fantasies that Freudians have about keeping, you know, I mean. Uh, or whether you're a more free-wheeling Jungian, but still are very clear about keeping boundaries, and uh, I've seen both. But if that frame, that boundary, I prefer to call it, is, is tight, then this kind of thing is possible. But this is not ego psychology here. I mean, you, you have changed through ego psychologies of various sorts. But what is being talked about here, and when, uh, when Langs is talking about that chaotic core being able to come up, talks about, talks about getting to the deep chaos in the psyche where the real wounds are, you know, the real deep ones, that those things won't get healed through ego psychology in the sense of uh, strengthening the ego or or through learning new behaviors or uh, that sort of thing, that those kinds of things, this is what Jung talks about analysis in various stages in the last stage is transformation. And I really believe that, that, that what you're talking about here is, is deep unconscious to unconscious changes. And clearly the unconscious of the therapist or analyst, in this case, I think usually analyst, is, as Jung said, in the soup. The unconscious is in, of the analyst is in the soup too, and in fact, it is the 
uh, capacity of the unconscious relating not the brilliance of interpretation or the or the, even the brilliant conscious awareness of what's going on with the analysis that is healing in that, in that part. What is healing is this cauldron through which all this stuff is bubbling up. It's allowed to bubble up, manifest. It's allowed to come out. It's allowed to be manifest and held and not attacked. Uh, if you hold it, and see, that's the thing about analysis that's different from therapy. I mean, there, there are many things about analysis that are different from therapy. But uh, these depth psychologies, will allow a lot of this really, quote, crazy, unquote, stuff to come up, be accepted and held, and there, therefore in that context, if the analyst does not recoil from it in horror, some counter-transference reaction, thereby doing just what the parent did years ago, the thing transforms without brilliant interpretation, without even brilliant understanding on the part of the analyst. It just transforms because they are there in this cooking cauldron of soup together. Uh, the Freudians, the co what the Cohutians call this transmuting internalization. Well, it just means that that craziness which we could have had transformed when we were children if our parenting ones were not so frightened by it and did not give us the message that it needed to be split off to the unconscious because they couldn't handle it. That that material can come back, manifest, and change in the process by just being accepted. And uh, that is exciting. That is the difference in, you know, short-term psychotherapy, which is going to make you better able to defend against these things. You know, a lot of therapies and they have to be. I mean, I understand that. But a lot of therapies exist to help people lie better. You know, anything which denies deep structural healing, it may be necessary in terms of triage, mental health triage. I mean, this person doesn't have the money or the time or the courage to do analysis. But in terms of what is actually happening, there's a lot of stuff in the soul needs to come out, manifest, be loved, and let it metamorph. They will never be given the psychotherapies, many of the psychotherapies we have. And what I'm saying is there are Freudians that do this kind of deep healing stuff. And the more they emphasize that, the closer they're getting to a Jungian modality. That's what Goodhart's pointing out in that article. Jung's understanding of the deepest healing and analysis uh, has been this kind of image all along. It's not to disparage any kind of help you can get any way you can get it. You know, people need it. But, uh, but the more wounded you are, especially early on in your life, then the more that stuff is split off from the consciousness. 
and the more you're afraid that nobody will ever be able to hold you and let it appear and not be horrified by it. And I think that that is why um, the understanding of the importance of the boundary, in some ways the capacity of the analyst to stand it and uh, uneasy business.